Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this virtual info day related to uh, the call for proposals of CEF Energy 2022 uh, dedicated to works and studies for projects of common interest. We have an interesting program ahead of us. The, um, the agenda, you have it here in front. Uh, we will uh, focus uh, the, um, the, the, our info day uh, first uh, on a, let's say, broad presentation. Uh, first, there will be an introduction and welcome by our executive director, uh, Dirk Beckers. Uh, will be followed then by presentation on the policy context and on the priorities of the CEF Energy Multiannual Work Program, which will be given by our colleagues of DG Energy. And the first part of the, of the info day will uh, present to you uh, the main uh, requirements in terms of uh, eligibility, award criteria, as well as evaluation process. We will have also a question and answer session that will uh, mark the end and a coffee break that will mark the end of the first part of, uh, of the info day. The second part will focus on uh, quite important topics related to the preparation of a successful proposal, to budget management in proposals and applications, and followed by presentation of uh, legal provisions as well as uh, um, a proposal submission and participant uh, portal a demonstration for, to facilitate applicants uh, to, to submit the application in the funding portal. Again, there will be a second possibility to uh, put questions and answers. The way we will deal with questions and answers uh, session will be done via Slido. So uh, we invite you to connect to Slido uh, and put your questions with the hashtag CEFEnergyPCIs. So we are here to reply uh, to your questions. We will take them at the end of the first set of presentations. We will provide these questions both in writing and orally, depending on the complexity of the questions. I already would like to say that we also have um, a system of uh, frequently asked questions. So uh, don't hesitate also after the info day to go to the funding portal and submit your question, uh, your question to us. We will reply in writing after that. We will also put um, in the funding portal all the material related to the info day and also to our, in our the CINEA website. Um, I would like to conclude this uh, short introduction of, of uh, the program of our virtual info day, and I will give now the floor to our executive director, uh, Mr. Dirk Beckers, to open the info day with a welcome from his side. Thank you. Dirk, the floor is yours. Thank you, Beatrice, and good morning to everybody from my side as well. So, uh, alongside with the colleagues from DGN and from Senior, uh, I would like to open this info day of the second CEF Energy Call on Projects for Common Interest for the CEF 21-27 program. Next slide, please. To start with, I would like to give you some information on CINEA, uh, which is an agency that was established on the 1st of April last year with the launch of the new MFF and as a continuation of the management of some programs that were previously managed by other agencies, uh, INEA and then uh, EASMA. Now, this new delegation brought more programs to the agency and a significant growth in terms of budget and staff, which will progressively increase from 21 to 27. And at the moment, as you can see on this slide, we are in charge of seven programs. We have the Horizon Europe Cluster 5 on climate, energy and mobility, the Innovation Fund program, the Connecting Europe facility, the, uh, the transport and energy parts of it, uh, the LIFE program, the European uh, Maritime Fisheries and Aquacultural Fund, uh, the Renewable Energy Financing Mechanism, and then, of course, as well, the uh, Just Transition Mechanism for the Public Sector and Loan Facility Pillar. 
Now, all these programs have made that the budget of the agency has grown to more than 58 billion euros for this uh, financial perspective period. And out of this amount, uh, a bit more than 31 billion are assigned to the management of the CEF program, as I mentioned, the transport and energy parts. Now, implementing this portfolio will, of course, contribute to fulfilling the objectives of the European Green Deal. Uh, which is the growth strategy to lead to an EU a sustainable economy and one of the top political priorities for the European Commission. Now, the Green Deal entails ambitious targets and intermediate milestones, such as, such as the revised greenhouse gas emissions reduction of 55% by 2030, for example. And in Senia, we play a crucial role as we are the EU focal point for funding green and infrastructure projects. Next slide, please. So let me now focus uh, more on SEV Energy, which uh, contributes to Senior's role to fulfill the Green Deal and to a better integrated and interconnected EU energy system. Now, SEF Energy, which was set up in 2013 on the basis of the 10E regulation recently revised, is a key EU funding instrument in the sector of energy. With the revised 10E entering into force in June 2022, fully aligning the policy framework with the European Green Deal, CEF Energy will contribute to further develop and interconnect energy networks in Europe and bring a key role to the energy transition. CEF Energy funding supports the transformation of European cross-border energy infrastructure into more resilient, green and digitized networks necessary to make the EU energy systems more interconnected and to contribute to a clean energy transition. Currently, the CEF program in the energy sector provides funding to electricity, smart grids, CO2 and natural gas infrastructure projects with the aim to better interconnect energy networks towards a single energy market in Europe. For this, Already between 2014 and 2022, uh, CEF Energy has supported or is supporting 151 actions for a total of uh, 4.9 billion euros. Now, the largest share of funding has supported works, which represent 89%, uh, for projects of common interest. Uh, projects in the electricity sector receive the biggest part of the CEF Energy funding, uh, around 60% of it, while gas projects receive around 31% and 9% are uh, retained for smart grids and CO2 networks. Next slide, please. So, um, let's see. So now, now you can see here on this slide a few success stories uh, that are part of the cornerstone projects and action supported by Seven Energy between 2014 and 2020 so far. So you, the three projects you see, the first one is the North-South Electricity Interconnections in Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe, uh, where the CEF Energy funding implemented the Bulgarian section of the project of Common Interest 371, which is a new 150-kilometer, 153-kilometer-long electricity line between Maritza East in Bulgaria and Nea Santa in Greece. Now, once this will be completed, the line will reinforce the internal Bulgarian grid enhance the cross-border capacity between Bulgaria and Greece and strengthen the European transmission system at the eastern border. Now, the second example is smart grids deployment. Uh, it's the implementation of the synchro grid PCI, or the second phase uh, in Slovenia. Now, the funding will allow the deployment of the compensation device in the substation Sirkovce, uh, solving the deficiency of reactive power flexibility and improving the voltage profile in the Slovenian as well as in the Croatian electric power systems. And then the last example on this slide is the gas interconnection between Poland and Lithuania, known as the GIPL, uh, where SEV Energy contributed to the construction of the Poland-Lithuania interconnection and its auxiliary installations. This interconnection between the natural gas systems of Poland and Lithuania will integrate the gas markets of the Baltic states and Finland into the common EU gas market and will give the possibility to transport gas from new import sources uh, like NLG terminals in Lithuania and Poland and in the future Norwegian gas from the Baltic pipe. Now, this project has already been inaugurated in May 2022 and all infrastructures are due to be completed by October this year. Uh, this project plays as well a key role in the current context of making the EU countries 
independent from the main gas supplier, which so far is still Russia, by enabling to import gas from other sources and via different routes. Next slide, please. So let me now outline as well the defending that we have available under SEF Energy a bit more in detail. Uh, during the period 21 to 27, uh, the SEF Energy funding will be available for sustainable energy infrastructure projects, uh, the projects of common interest, and then as well for cross-border projects in the field of renewable energy, the CBRS projects. Now, for this, a budget of 5.35 billion euros will be managed by Sinia, covering the two sectors. And then um, under the revised 10E, new infrastructure categories such as offshore electricity grids, hydrogen infrastructure, and smart grids in gas will be available for funding under SEV Energy. As usual, the calls for proposals will be announced by Sinia in due time to our different channels. Uh, next slide, please. As you can see on this slide, this is indeed the second call for the PCI works and studies on the SEF2 Energy PCI calls, making available 800 million euros. Now, the call which was opened on the 18th of May as, power of, as, sorry, as part of the Repower EU plan will close on the 1st of September 2022. Now, today's info day will present the policy context of the call and, of course, as well, the application and evaluation process and will provide participants with valuable tricks and, and uh, tips on writing a successful proposal. Now, as usual, and as you know for sure already, more of this information can be found on our on Senior's website, uh, where we invite you to follow uh, what's happening. Uh, next slide, please. And my last slide. So, uh, you can... Uh, of course, if you want to know a bit more about CINIA, not only on SEF Energy, but maybe the other programs that we're managing as well, you can find everything about the different programs and, of course, the calls that we are publishing and our different activities. And you can find them on our dedicated social ch channels and websites. So you can you can see the addresses on this uh, on this uh, slide. So you can you can find the, everything there. And of course. Uh, don't hesitate to contact us, uh, Beatrice, the colleagues, myself, in case of need, uh, if you don't find what you need or if you want to have a more personalized discussion, that's always welcome. So so on this, I would like to stop there because your morning, I think, I think is more than well filled. So I would like to wish you all a very nice info day today. And of course, wish you good luck with, uh, with your applications or with your potential applications. I would say the more, the better, of course, the better quality, the more we like it. So many thanks. And uh, of course, Senia will remain available to support you in all of this. Thank you and have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Dirk, for uh, this warm <laughs> welcome to the Info Day. Uh, now, with it further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Joachim Balke, who is uh, Head of Unit in uh, DG Energy for Infrastructure and Regional Cooperation, and he will explain the policy context underpinning this call for proposals uh, in terms of European energy infrastructure policy. Joachim, please. Thank you very much, Beatrice, and uh, welcome, of course, also from my side to everybody. Um, and I hope that you can hear me uh, well at this stage. Um, I'll uh, indeed say a few words about the policy context um, of in which this particular CEF call is taking place. Um, I try to be as short as possible, given that we've uh, lost a bit of time, so that uh, we have enough time then uh, for the discussion and, and your questions. Now, if we go to the to the first slide, please. Um, <clears throat> if we look at the um, the policy, con the energy policy context over the last couple of years, uh, what I do want to say is that we've seen uh, a number of shifts uh, in priority, um, even over relatively short periods, um, with a focus, of course, on achieving the sustainability objectives, uh, which is constantly there, but um, in particular. In light of recent uh, developments, of course, a strong uh, emphasis on security of supply. Now, I think the key thing here is that um, whatever the focus is in terms of policy objective, trans-European energy networks uh, are a key component uh, for the solution. So in a sense, the 10E framework that we have 
um, maintains its its crucial role, um, whatever in a, in a sense the, sh the short term uh, focus is on when we look at our energy policy priorities. And it is very much uh, through the existing 10E framework that we have managed to advance um, in achieving um, a more integrated uh, energy system in Europe. Um, this framework um, has actually proved uh, quite uh, efficient and uh, robust because it's built on uh, a very solid analysis of the infrastructure needs uh, here um, historically for electricity and gas in particular, but also for oil, uh, CO2 transport and smart grids, um, analyzed um, on, a, uh, on an objective basis. Uh, all projects uh, have to prove uh, um, that they have a positive um, CBA um, based on discussions uh, with relevant member states uh, in the regional groups uh, to ensure that the selection really focuses on those projects uh, which have the highest uh, added value at European level. And then uh, finally, uh, what this 10E um, has, also, um, has also proven is, um, let's say, a toolkit which helps to implement those projects in the best possible manner and um, where we look at uh, essentially three sets of instruments. Um, the first ones related to permitting, uh, the second, um, a set of regulatory measures, which uh, are helpful in particular for cross-border projects. Um, and then thirdly, um, EU financial assistance. Um, but of course, here it is important to stress also against the limited budget um, that this is a measure of last resort. So we have a whole toolkit which helps with the implementation of those projects. Uh, if we move to the next, uh, to the next slide. Now, uh, we have, as uh, Dirk said in his opening presentation, which I, I hope you've been able to hear, uh, we have recently revised the 10E regulation. Um, the new 10E regulation has now been published only a few days ago. Um, and that, um, is, uh, that revised 10E regulation uh, reflects in particular the, um, our ambition uh, in terms of becoming a climate neutral economy by mid-century. Um, the European Green Deal, um, and in particular the Fit for 55 objectives um, that, um, uh, in a sense, uh, look at accelerating our path towards net zero, um, and in particular set us on a very, very rapid decarbonization path already uh, over the next decade. Um, and for infrastructure, uh, here, of course, the, the one challenge that needs to be underlined is uh, the one in relation to renewable energy. Uh, we have most recently in the repower communication, on which I'll say a word in a minute, again um, upgraded uh, our renewable target uh, for 2030. We have proposed to make it 45%. This is across the board. So this translates in significantly higher numbers for electricity. Um, and that is obviously the key challenge here, that our electricity grids um, uh, will have to be made fit for um, a, an electricity mix which will essentially rely on uh, renewables, and in particular variable renewables, uh, already in a decade. Uh, and that is a major shift which requires enormous investments. Um, now, this, all of this is underpinned, uh, the new 10E, uh, by the new CEF2 program uh, for, the, for this MFF. Um, this will continue to provide crucial support to infrastructure projects uh, to help um, with the energy transition. Uh, and here, of course, important to mention that uh, this uh, CEF2 for energy also includes a window for cross-border uh, projects in the field of renewable energy, uh, which will complement the support to infrastructure. If we go to the next slide, just a few words um, in the, on, the, on the very recent policy context, um, which is reflected in the Repower Plan. Uh, that is, of course, um, a significant, uh, let's say, development uh, as regards our energy policy, uh, because in reaction um, to, the, uh, to the invasion of, of, uh, of Russia and Ukraine, uh, we have uh, proposed this Repower Plan, plan um, looking in particular at the, uh, the needs for our energy system, which stem from the objective, commonly shared objective um, in the current situation to actually end uh, Russian fossil fuel imports uh, very, very soon and certainly well before the end of the decade. Now, um, I think the key to underline here is that uh, what we need to do is um, to continue uh, with our path uh, of decarbonizing the economy uh, and to accelerate it uh, even more. 
Uh, so clearly, uh, this remains the top priority. Um, but besides that, there are a number of uh, sort of more short-term actions, um, which look in particular at further accelerating uh, the diversification of fossil fuel imports away from Russia. Um, now for oil, we've already imposed an embargo, but for gas in particular, um, <clears throat> we are now looking um, again, let's say, at a situation where um, we do want to end Russian uh, gas imports. Now, um, I think it's important to say that what the uh, 10E policy has done over the last decade actually um, gets us a long way towards this objective because um, uh, all our policy on gas infrastructure has been about diversification uh, of sources, and it is thanks to a number of key projects, many of them uh, supported in the past by CEF, um, that we are actually able to deal with the current situation uh, related to, to gas imports uh, from Russia, which have already been stopped to a number of member states. Of course, we should, uh, under no circumstances, forget, and the Repower Plan underlines that, that um, addressing uh, transmission bottlenecks in electricity um, is uh, and remains absolutely key, and uh, these need to be accelerated, uh, as the Repower Plan points out. If we go to the next slide. Now, as I said, um, we've gone a long way to uh, making our infrastructure robust uh, to situations like the one we are facing today. And this is to a large extent um, thanks to the work in particular of the high-level groups, um, which, uh, which you know about. There are four of them in the, in the four different regions um, that, that I mentioned below. Now here, um, the specificity of these high-level groups is that they bring together political support uh, on the one hand, with technical expertise uh, on the other, um, and in that way they have allowed to identify really, to identify and agree uh, at regional level on the key infrastructure projects uh, which are needed uh, in these four regions. Um, and it has been possible thanks to this formula of the regional high level groups uh, to implement uh, many of those projects also uh, really complex and, um, and um, significant projects. Um, so it's very, um, it's very important that this work continues. Uh, these four high-level groups come from different backgrounds, but as we go uh, to the future, we see in a sense that uh, their programs are converging uh, with a focus, strong focus on both infrastructure but also renewable developments in the future and um, uh, in electricity in particular, but also going forward uh, for hydrogen. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, if we look uh, now, if we zoom in um, into the situation um, as we have it today and which determines also then the scope, let's say, of the CEF call uh, that uh, we're talking about today. Now, um, of course, as in the past, uh, all projects uh, which are uh, on the current uh, PCI list uh, are eligible uh, for um, applications in the CEF call. So the fifth, the current fifth PCI list um, has been uh, adopted uh, by the Commission um, at the end of last year and has in the meantime also entered into force following the, the scrutiny period uh, of the co-legislator. Um, and uh, this PCI list, as you're aware, <clears throat> is the last one under the current 10E regulation. Um, so it is also the last one which will contain gas uh, projects, um, with sort of a small exception in the new 10E. Um, but in principle, this is the new, uh, the last uh, PCI list containing gas projects. Now, um, <clears throat> as you can see here, uh, we have uh, 20 gas projects on the list today, so the number here is uh, significantly reduced, which reflects the fact that our gas system is uh, much more resilient uh, than it's been in the past. The vast majority of projects that we have are in the area of electricity transmission uh, and storage, um, and we do also have um, a certain number of CO2 and smart grid projects um, <clears throat> certainly in these categories, uh, we still see a, a room in particular also for smart grids, uh, perhaps for, uh, for having a bit more projects in the future. Um, but, um, but what we do see also is that a couple of those projects uh, um, uh, in, in particular in those areas have now started to mature. Some have already been finalized. And uh, we've also seen in past calls <clears throat> that there have been uh, successful CEF applications from this uh, from these categories. So all in all, uh, 98 PCIs, which are eligible, eligible for support. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, 
uh, again looking at the logic uh, of 10E and how CEF uh, fits in that logic, um, it is of course very important uh, again to underline, uh, as I did in the earlier on, uh, that we have um, in a sense a, um, a, a toolkit and that financial support, in particular financial support for the construction uh, of projects, is a, is a last resort uh, for those projects who really need it. Uh, this is also a necessity due to the, the very limited budget. We have only about four billion left uh, for the rest of the period. Now, um, that means that, of course, first of all, um, in order to become a PCI, as I said, you have to have a positive CBA. And this, in a sense, is the first uh, filter. Then, uh, following that, uh, there are different uh, instruments which can support the implementation of PCIs. So, um, first of all, the regulatory instruments that I mentioned, uh, cross-border cost allocation, um, also regulatory incentives uh, can and should be used um, um, where uh, investments, uh, for example, have particular risk profiles. And then uh, only the last uh, resort, uh, if still uh, with these instruments used, um, there is a financing gap, would be financial uh, support um, from the CEF uh, facility. If we go to the next slide, um, now this is an overview over the PCIs and electricity that we have, and of course I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, I think the main message here is that um, we have managed uh, to build, I would say, a relatively integrated electricity network, in particular in the Central European region already, again, thanks to the 10E policy and CEF support. There are in particular a number of challenges remaining um, when it comes to the connection of, let's say, the more peripheral regions um, of Europe, the Iberian Peninsula, also Ireland, of course, in a, is in a specific situation after Brexit. Um, and uh, there are a number of uh, internal lines also in a number of member states which are still needed in order to release capacity at borders um, and to fully integrate uh, the, uh, the internal market. Um, and lastly, in all regions, there is still a need for more flexibility, um, meaning, for example, storage, uh, in order to allow the integration of renewables. If we come to the next slide, um, for gas, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, again, we have a relatively um, solid uh, and resilient grid already. Uh, nevertheless, there are some uh, needs um, still identified, which are addressed through the 20 gas PCIs, so well focused, uh, quite focused also on a number of regions in Europe, um, in particular uh, Central and Southeastern Europe, where the majority of remaining uh, gas PCIs lie. Um, <clears throat> and also, apart from that, um, there is still the challenge of fully tapping into the gas reserves, in particular in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, which is reflected in the PCI list. Um, let's again move on, perhaps already to the last slide. So if we look at um, where we go from here, now um, uh, we have, um, uh, thanks to CEF, uh, amongst other, uh, other things, already managed to complete 75 uh, PCIs. Um, 26 have received the CEF support of those uh, which have been completed. Um, as I mentioned, um, now, of course, we're looking um, at, a, at a new uh, legal context because the new 10 regulation has entered uh, into force. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this very much reflects the Green Deal objectives. Um, this means that there are a number of new categories, uh, notably hydrogen, um, but also smart gas grids and categories in relation, um, or let's say at least there's a larger eligibility in relation to offshore grids. Um, these are some of the highlights. <clears throat> now, these will inform uh, the next PCI list, um, which we expect to address in autumn. Um, and, um, and based on that, um, we will then, um, in 2024, have a CEF call for proposals uh, where uh, normally um, <clears throat> PCIs uh, based on this new revised 10E regulation uh, should be eligible to apply. But that is uh, for the future, of course, for today and for the call which is open at the moment. Uh, the eligibility is the current list based on the current 10E regulation. Um, that was all I wanted to say by way of introduction. Um, thanks very much. Beatrice, back to you. Thanks a lot, Joachim, for this uh, presentation. I suggest that we move uh, now on to the next presentation, which will be provided by Rafael Sauter, 
We steam leader in uh, the same unit in DG Energy, so Infrastructure and Regional Cooperation Unit. The presentation will focus on the priorities of the CEF Energy Multiannual Work Program and a presentation of the call for proposals for projects of common interest in 2022, so the current call. So, Rafael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Beatrice. Um, as uh, Beatrice explained, I will go uh, through the multi-annual work program, which uh, constitutes the basis for the call of proposal, and then go into a bit of more details on the 2022 uh, call for proposals for projects um, of common interest. So the multi-annual work program um, was adopted uh, already in uh, uh, 2021, so it was adopted last year, and it sets out the basis for the cause of proposals under SEF Energy um, and also includes um, elements on the program support actions, which are now called technical and administrative assistance. Um, and the multi annual work program is an important uh, uh, document not only because it sets the legal basis, so to speak, for the call of proposals, because, but also because it provides information on the forms of financial assistance uh, that can be provided, on the indicative um, timetable uh, of the calls uh, for proposals, and also on the uh, total commitment appropriations and the uh, indicative budget uh, for the calls uh, planned. And the multi-annual work program covers three years, so it was adopted in 2021 and runs um, until uh, 2023. And the legal basis uh, for the work program is, of course, the financial regulation and then the Connecting Europe facility regulation that entered for, into force in 2021 and the 10E regulation as uh, entered into force in 2013. So the old 10E regulation, if you like, as was explained uh, in the presentation earlier, the revised 10E regulation was published last Friday in the official journal and will enter into force on the 23rd of June. But here the legal basis mm -hmm. is the 10E regulation of 2013. And the last imp uh, important um, legal document is the fifth PCI list that was adopted in November 2020 and entered into force in March uh, 2021. The budget was mentioned uh, also in previous uh, presentations, so we have an overall budget of uh, 5.83 billion for the entire period 2021 to 2027, and the work program um, which covers 2021 to 2023, um, authorizes uh, commitments of uh, 2.4 billion. An important element um, that uh, should be mentioned in this context is that under the new CEF2 regulation, 15% of the total amount allocated to CEF energy subject to market uptake is to be allocated to cross-border projects in the field of renewable energy. And if the 15% threshold is reached, the Commission shall increase the amount to uh, up to 20%, again, subject to market uptake. And if there is not sufficient market uptake uh, by cross-border renewable projects, then the unused budget um, shall be used to finance PCIs. And uh, as of 2024, unused funds uh, could then uh, be transferred to the renewable energy uh, financing uh, mechanism. On the objectives uh, of the work program, um, first of all, it's to enable projects of common interest PCIs to be prepared and implemented within the framework of the 10E policy framework that was explained in the previous presentation, as well as cross-border projects in the field of renewable energy, and uh, financing actions contributing uh, to the achievement of the goals and objectives of the Paris Agreement, as well as the 2030 climate and energy targets uh, and the long-term decarbonization objectives, as well as uh, sector integration inter alia through synergy measures. 
And um, the European Green Deal has further emphasized the uh, key enabling role of energy infrastructure and um, hence the financial assistance provided under this work program should maximize its added value uh, towards uh, decarbonization. And here the last point um, is that 60% of the overall financial envelope um, under CEF 2021 to 27 should support um, climate uh, objectives. The expected results um, of the financial assistance provided um, under CEF Energy should uh, contribute to the further development and implementation of projects of common interest as well as cross-border pro cross renewable projects and ultimately to help reaching the CEF Energy uh, policy objectives. Uh, which are um, four. Uh, it's the further integration of an efficient and competitive internal energy market. It's the interoperability of networks across borders and sectors. Um, it's the facilitation of decarbonization of the economy, promoting energy efficiency and ensuring security of supply and cross-border cooperation in the area of energy, including renewable energy. In terms of actions uh, to be supported in the energy sector, um, this derives from what I've explained earlier. There are threefold. It's uh, projects of common interest, PCIs, it's cross-border projects um, in the field of renewable energy, and it's uh, last but not least uh, program support actions or technical uh, and administrative assistance as mentioned earlier. So that's on the work program. Now more specifically on the PCIs and the call for proposals uh, that uh, we present today. It covers both studies contributing to the preparation of the implementation of a PCI and works contributing to the actual implementation uh, of a PCI. And um, in terms of the uh, budget uh, available, um, for the 2022 call, um, you see uh, in this table that the uh, indicative budget uh, is uh, 800 million euros and the work program, as I mentioned earlier, provides already indicative information for 2023. Um, the indicative budget is 696 million euros. And um, I think there was already a question on the specific timing of the 2023 call. I mean, as uh, is indicated in the work program, um, it says quarter one, two in 2023. We expect uh, this to happen in early 2023 um, and will further specify this subject to um, um, further information. So that's the indicative um, information we can give uh, at this stage and um, the budget um, as um, we foresee it um, at the moment. In terms of the priorities for the 2022 call, it's about the further integration um, of the internal energy market, ending energy isolation and eliminating electricity interconnection bottlenecks, with an emphasis on those PCIs contributing to the achievement of the interconnection target of at least 10% by 2020 and 15% uh, by 2030, and PCIs contributing to uh, synchronization of electricity systems with the EU networks, um, as well as technologies and PCIs contributing to the decarbonization of the economy. And thirdly, uh, as was mentioned earlier, um, it is um, the contribution to the objectives of the Repower EU plan, uh, meaning the increase uh, of the resilience of the EU-wide energy system by speeding up the implementation of infrastructure projects in order to phase out dependency on fossil fuels from Russia by uh, 2027. In terms of co-financing rate for grants, um, they are um, by default in most cases uh, up to 50% of the total eligible cost for studies and works. We have then, if I may call it two exceptions, one is up to 70% of the total eligible cost for works in outermost regions. So if a project takes place in outermost uh, regions, um, a works uh, project, and uh, up to 75% of the total eligible costs for actions contributing uh, to the development of PCIs in the electricity and gas sectors. 
in uh, exceptional cases, in the case of exceptionally high uh, externalities if proven and demonstrated in the application. I would then um, conclude with my last slide on climate proofing. Um, applications for grants for works um, which are subject to an environmental impact assessment must include information uh, on the climate proofing of such a project and it should take into account of the technical guidance document on the climate proofing of infrastructure in the period 2021-2027, which was published uh, by the Commission in 2021. And such information may be provided in the form of a summary of, of the main findings and conclusions, notably as regards uh, climate adaptation measures to mitigate potential impacts of climate change uh, on the project. In cases, uh, if in case an application um, has not yet concluded the environmental impact assessment, the application uh, shall um, confirm that climate proofing will be considered as part of the environmental impact assessment. Um, and there is uh, one exception, applications um, which relate to projects for which the environmental impact assessment was already completed before the 31st of December 2021 are not uh, subject to this uh, specific uh, requirement um, on climate proofing. So I stop here um, and thank you very much uh, for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Rafael, for this uh, very clear presentation. And now uh, I'd like to start a presentation, uh, which is quite long, so bear, bear with me. Um, the presentation covers uh, uh, a lot of topics uh, for, uh, um, let's say, let's say to present the process of evaluation, but at the same time also we will present the admissibility, eligibility, and the work criteria. Um, I go immediately to the next slide. So that's about the evaluation process. So here you, you, you see what is uh, the call timeline, tentative, in a sense that the call was published on the 18th of May and it will close on the 1st of September at 17 hours, Brussels time. Um, we will conduct the evaluation of proposals uh, by November 2022 and with a view to consult the CEF uh, coordination committee by December 2022 and inform the European Parliament. That means uh, that uh, the successful applicants will uh, be informed uh, around December 2022, January 2023, and we will launch with them also the process of grant preparation with the objective to finalize the grants, uh, the grant agreement at the latest by June 2023 in view of legal uh, deadlines and obligations. Um, here you see what are the principles for the evaluation and the selection process. So once uh, uh, the applications are received by uh, the deadline, uh, CINEA will conduct first admissibility and eligibility check, and I will come to this in a moment. Um, those, uh, um, uh, those proposals which pass these uh, checks will be uh, put forward for external evaluation. So, so uh, CINEA will uh, let's organize evaluation with independent external experts, which will first assess individually the applications and then convene in consensus meetings uh, with the objective to uh, assess uh, the evaluation according to the award criteria and provide an overall assessment of, of the proposals. The evaluation will be then finalized by an internal committee in the Commission with a representative of director in the Directorate General for Energy, assisted by CINEA, that will lead to a final selection of, uh, of proposals and the recommended list of proposals, a draft list recommended for funding. That step is with the Commission. Through all the steps, uh, the, um, let's say, a scrutiny of the compliance of the proposals with the selection criteria and the EU law will be also uh, performed. Uh, the end of the selection process is as follows. Uh, so once, let's say, the draft list is, uh, is prepared, 
by the internal committee. It will follow uh, an internal procedure at the Commission, so there will be an inter-service consultation with other Commission services. And once this is closed, the self-coordination committee, according to comitology rules, will be consulted as well as also the European Parliament will be informed. Um, following this consultation, uh, the Commission will adopt officially the selection decision um, and uh, uh, the applicants who are retained in the selection decision will be then uh, invited by, uh, to, let's say, to launch a grant agreement preparation phase. I will follow on this at the end of my presentation. And all applicants will be informed at the same time. So both the successful ones and also the unsuccessful ones. Let's move to uh, the admissibility eligibility criteria. So, um, so in order to be admissible, a proposal must, first of all, be submitted by the call deadline. So 1st of September, 5 o'clock, Central European time. The, the only submission tool is via the funding and tender portal uh, electronic submission system. So no other submission, like paper submission, is uh, envisaged. Uh, the proposal should be complete, must be complete, and contain all the requested information and annexes and supporting documents, and we will go through that also in a moment. Bear in mind that there will be no follow-up for missing, for missing documents, so make sure that all the, all the documents are uploaded uh, in, in the system before you uh, press the final button for submission. For admissibility, also an application must be readable, accessible, and, printed, and printable, uh, and submitted according to the templates which are provided in the funding portals. Proposals should be limited to 120 pages, the part B, and we will not consider any additional pages. Um, from now on, I will have a number of slides, three or four slides, um, that I will, let's say, go a bit quickly through them, uh, but you should keep them in mind. And uh, when you work on your application, please refer to these slides. Uh, they're quite useful in terms of, um, let's say, making sure that the documents uh, that you submit uh, will be complete and that all, all the annexes are duly uh, filled in and, uh, and submitted. So first of all, here you find uh, your checklist that is applicable for proposal both for studies and works. So what are the documents that should be filled in? Again, I'll go very quickly. So we have a part A, a part B, a budget table, a gun chart, an agreement by the member state, an environmental compliance file, a TENI compliance form, uh, a PCI annual report when, uh, when that exists. And then we have annual activity reports and list of previous projects that is not needed for public bodies, member states organization, certified TSOs, and other international organization. In terms also of, um, let's say, completeness of documents, uh, if you are preparing a works application, please bear in mind that uh, your application must also contain uh, for electricity and gas PCIs, except hydro pump electricity storage, a full project specific CBA, and a project specific legally valid cross-border cost allocation, so what we call a CBCA and also a business plan and or other assessments showing that the project is commercially not viable. If you are a smart grid or cross-border carbon dioxide uh, PCI and you're preparing a work application, you will only have to submit a business plan and other assessments. And this is in addition to the previous uh, documents. Uh, this slide refers to uh, the letter of support, so the agreement by the concerned member state how this should be filled in. So basically, I will not go through that in detail, but uh, it is important to bear in mind that this duly signed form should be provided by all member states who are concerned by the application in a sense that the proposed project will be implemented in their territory. And this form should also be provided for all concerned applicants in the proposal. 
Again here, uh, very quickly, uh, there is also an environmental compliance file that must be completed for all uh, projects. So all, pro all applications must have this compliance file uh, completed. The level of completion changes if you are, let's say, uh, applying for a works and studies with physical intervention. Then you have to fill a number, let's say, of uh, boxes, and there are also, let's say, different requirements on uh, who has, let's say, to sign in the member state and what type of declaration in terms, for example, of Natura 2000 sites. If you are instead applying for a study without physical intervention, then there is only, let's say, an option to be clicked, and then you can upload the document. But the document must be uploaded. Again, there are also, uh, let's say, some, in, some, let's say, requirements for what concerns the compliance with the TENI regulation. So it's compliance with the EU law on energy infrastructures. And uh, without going into the details of that, that must also be filled by the applicants and must also be annexed to the applications. Um, in case there are multiple applicants, preferably include only one where, let's say, the data for each country or each applicant is included. And this must be signed by the promoter and not by the member state. Um, and again, uh, indication on the latest PCI annual report. If you are not, if you are a new PCI of the fifth list, you might not have a P, uh, the latest report, so you are not required to submit. In all the other cases, you are required to submit. And I mentioned already in my previous slide the requirements for the annual activity reports and the list of previous projects. Um, this, uh, um, all these slides that I presented already, uh, the content uh, you can find both in the presentation, but also we have a number of frequently asked questions uh, already in the funding portal. So you can just, let's say, make a search there under the relevant page of the call, and you will find all the detailed explanation on that. Now, let's move to uh, what are the eligibility uh, requirements of the call. So um, first of all, let's say, as explained already, only project that contributes to PCIs as identified in the delegated regulation uh, relevant to the fifth PCI list are eligible to apply. So projects who are not uh, referring to the PCIs in the fifth PCI list are not eligible. You can apply for a study or you can apply for works. You cannot apply at the same time for a proposal for studies and works together. For, to know more what is, what is intended as a study and what is intended as a works, here you see the, um, the definition in, uh, that is in, uh, in the CEF regulation. So studies, they are preparatory activities normally uh, needed to prepare the PCI implementation, while works in the meaning of CEF energy relate to purchase, supply, and deployment of components uh, and services, including also software, construction, installation, the acceptance of installation, and so on. Uh, who are eligible participants? Uh, the call also specifies that eligible applicants must be legal entities, public or private bodies, be established in one of the eligible countries that are EU member states, and there is also a list on non-EU countries. Uh, beneficiaries and also affiliated entities, they must register in participant uh, portal before submitting the proposals. Please also bear in mind that before, um, before really your application will be, let's say, um, proceed for the grant agreement, the, uh, legal, the legal entities will also be validated and we will, uh, by central validation services of the commission, and for validation, we will request, uh, uh, if need be, to upload additional documents on your legal status and origin. I would like also to mention, in terms of eligibility, that uh, there are exceptions to uh, the country of origin of the eligible applicants, and that concerns uh, um, that, let's say, exceptional funding conditions. So uh, third country exceptions are possible if the granting authority consider the participation of these applicants indispensable for the achievement of uh, the objectives of a PCI. And this your text is reflected also in the call. 
Um, in order to be um, uh, to comply with uh, all, let's say, uh, the rules, uh, we also are assessing uh, operational capacity of applicants because applicants must have the know-how, the qualifications, and resources to successfully implement the project and contribute to their share. And for that, we are requiring the applicants to provide a description of the participants, activity report, list of projects, and so on, with the exceptions on uh, a public body member states, TSOs, and other organizations that were already explained. Applicants will also undergo uh, a financial capacity check. And this is because um, applicants, in order to uh, carry out the project, they have to demonstrate to have stable and sufficient resources to successfully implement the project. Um, so we will do a financial capacity check, will be done by uh, central services as well as CINEA, if needed. Uh, but this will be done only for those applicants who will be uh, in the selection list or a reserve list and on the basis of the documents that they will be requested to upload when they submit the, uh, the, the proposal. So this is a check that will be done only after uh, the evaluation is concluded. And again, there are exceptions for those for uh, applicants uh, who are exempted. Uh, if need be, uh, the f financial capacity check will result uh, uh, in a satisfactory result or not. And if the results are not satisfactory, we might require, uh, we might request to you further information or we might put mitigating measures um, in terms of, uh, let's say, the, the, the pre-financing that uh, will be provided to, to CINEA, by CINEA, once your project starts. The next slide. Uh, we go now to another section, and that relates to the presentation of the award criteria. So for an application to be selected, uh, the proposal will have to fill in a number, let's say, of uh, boxes. Let me put it uh, this way both in part A, but in particular in part B of the application. And, and this is important that these, let's say, parts of the parts B and A are well, let's say, filled in with all, let's say, and very thoroughly by applicant. They refer to, um, let's say, the award criteria that um, the official award criteria of, uh, of the call for proposals. So in order, let's say, for proposals to be selected, an assessment of the, um, let's say, compliance of the proposal of the application with the following award criteria will be carried out and mainly by, uh, by our evaluators. So the criteria are five. They are uh, qualitatively evaluated, but there is also a quantification associated to that with a score range from zero to five. And in order to pass, uh, there is a minimum pass score per hour criteria of three and an overall pass score of uh, five, meaning that uh, for a proposal, let's say, to be selected, a minimum uh, overall score is of 15 and a maximum will be of 25. Those who are below the minimum individual and the, and the minimum overall score Will not, be, um, will not be retained for, uh, for the selection and for funding. So let's go a bit quickly on uh, the various criteria. A quick presentation. So the first one relates to the priority and urgency of the action. And, um, and, this, is, uh, uh, and this relates to uh, evaluate, evaluating the correspondence of your proposal with the policy targets, objectives, and priorities, what uh, both Joachim and Rafael described, in particular, uh, the contribution and alignment to the 2030 climate and energy targets, and let's say with a view to reach the climate neutrality uh, by 2050 as per the European Green Deal objective. But it also refers to uh, objectives of market integration <coughs> and where applicable also, uh, your proposal might have some synergies uh, with other sectors, in particular uh, transport or digital. And where applicable, this will also be assessed. Elements to be retained here um, is that you have to demonstrate this correspondence or contribution to the sectoral policy objectives. 
uh, the contribution to market integration, to ending energy isolation, to el eliminating electricity uh, interconnection bottlenecks, and synchronization of electricity system with U networks. In terms of synergies, bear in mind that uh, the way it will be evaluated, uh, it's done in a way that your proposal will need to show how uh, this will significantly improve the socioeconomic climate or environmental benefits of a proposed action, so to the, the synergy element. Last but not least, uh, you will find also um, in, the, uh, in, in the part B uh, some questions related to EU added value. Um, we, we would like to say that we consider that EU added value of an action related to a PCI is demonstrated by the PCI status itself. Uh, the next uh, criterion refers to maturity. So here we are assessing the maturity of the proposed project in the context of the PCI development. This is one aspect. And the second aspect relates to uh, assessing the readiness or the ability of the proposed project to start by the proposed date and to be completed by the proposed end date. For that, um, uh, we are requesting information uh, in relation to the preparatory steps of the project, so what has been already completed or envisaged to be completed in the short term, so that we can assess that the project can be carried out without delay. Um, this is important because we assess the confirmation of the proposed project to be mature enough to be financed under this call. So your project might, let's say, propose activities which are going to start, let's say, very late in time, perhaps in one or two years in time. This is, let's say, uh, this might be considered or not, let's say, uh, maybe uh, a lower level of maturity. Um, we uh, ideally, let's say, we would like to finance applications that are really ready to start their activities as soon as possible. Uh, we also are looking for a justification that the project is the next step in the PCI implementation. How do we do that? So you will have to, let's say, fill carefully the part B, but also um, provide information uh, in terms of the PCI annual report. There are also sections related to procurement procedures. Uh, for works, we also ask for a summary of public con consultation, if applicable, and uh, authorizations, approvals, and permits. Then there is also a box related to uh, financial viability and an explanation of the efforts undertaken to secure other sources of funding. The quality criterion, uh, here we are evaluating the soundness of the implementation plan proposed, both from a technical and financial point of view, the organizational structure put in place or foreseen uh, for the implementation of the project, the risk management methods and procedures, uh, the control procedures, and, uh, and the quality management. Uh, we will assess the resource needed, so both financial and human, to implement the project, and an evidence that the project is correctly sized. And uh, one important element to bear in mind is that uh, the cost related to project management should have, let's say, a threshold of 10% maximum of total project cost. We consider that this is really the maximum uh, reasonable for uh, typical projects uh, in the PCI context to, to be carried out. Then we have uh, another work criteria, which is quite quite uh, large because it addresses several elements. So that's the impact of our criterion. So first of all, this impact addresses the relevant externalities of the project, such as security of supply, innovation, and solidarity among member states. This Im impact criterion also addresses the climate and environmental impact for works. Uh, it addresses as well the need to overcome financial obstacles, such as those generated by sufficient commercial viability. And for works also, it assesses the cross-border dimension of the project. So here, for externalities, they, they will have to be described building on the project-specific CBA, and we will only look at security of supply, innovation, and solidarity among member states. Externalities is only a criterion valid for works, and I uh, want to emphasize that 
we only look at the three externalities, those SOS, solidarity, and innovation. And uh, despite, let's say, the criterion impact uh, covering uh, several elements, um, the, the fact that, uh, let's say, the proposal must uh, show significant externalities is an absolute uh, must in order for the proposal to reach a minimum score of three under this criterion. And this is because, let's say, uh, the 10 the year regulation provides this, uh, let's say, this requirement that, that the project could be can be financed only in presence of significant externalities. So this is really, let's say, uh, a, a very important element to keep in mind. The impact uh, also considered for works the cross-border dimension, so including area of impact, member states concerned, how the cooperation between member states and promoters works, and financial contribution by member states as promoters as per CBCA, again only for works. Um, if relevant also, cooperation may be addressed to other countries beyond where those where the action takes place. And we also look at revenues at revenue potential. Last but not least, uh, the criterion impact, as I mentioned, uh, refers to the environmental and climate impact of uh, the project. That again refers only to works, uh, including also a reference, as Rafael explained, to climate proofing and climate resilience. An element which is common to both studies and works uh, in the impact criterion is an explanation and a justification for the financial obstacles of the project uh, and how really uh, the EU funding will help to overcome them. And uh, building on uh, the financial uh, obstacles criterion, uh, the last uh, award criterion refers to the catalytic effect, where uh, here we evaluate if there is a financial gap and uh, if there is a capacity from the promoter, from the applicant, to mobilize diff different investment sources. And basically, the justification of the self-financial assistance for projects that uh, reflect, uh, let's say, uh, significant, that contain significant amount of externalities, as explained before. So the criterion shall assess the catalytic effect of the EU financial assistment, assistance, and when possible, also, we will determine the actual co-funding rate to be granted. So here, it's important to keep in mind that uh, what Joachim presented, so SEF is really the last resort uh, for works proposal in particular. So the explanations provided by the applicant uh, should, uh, should, con uh, sh should reflect why really SEF grant will help the, to mobilize the funding, why SEF grant is needed, uh, and, and will make a positive difference to the acceleration of the implementation of, uh, of, of the project. So that's really, uh, I think, an explanation and a justification of the use of SEF as a last resource to finance the project. Maybe last point on that, um, for works proposals, as also Rafael mentioned in his presentation, um, there is a possibility to request a higher co-funding rate than uh, 50%, but uh, in, that, in that case, a detailed justification of the exceptional circumstances uh, in view, let's say, of the extent of significant externalities should be provided. So this is really, I want to stress, a real exception. It exists, but it's a real exception. So we are going to conclusion. Uh, maybe it's just some last tips. So the application covers different criteria, as I explained. It can be quite long. So make sure, really, that you fill uh, the information in a coherent and consistent way. Across the application, again, check all the completeness of the documents. And uh, the term, you maybe also another small tip concerns maybe the term project that is used in application forms. Sometimes you also see the term action, which is used in self-regulation. So we use this two uh, element to, to word a bit in an inter, inter-exchangeable way. It refers really to the application and not to the project of common interest as such. 
And last but not least, as I mentioned before, uh, we have already plenty of FAQs on the participant portal that cover uh, a broad range of questions from submission to admissibility, eligibility, selection criteria, award criteria, uh, documents, uh, CBCA, CBA. So please uh, look at, uh, look at, at, this, at this page. And of course, you are always, uh, let's say, welcome to, to ask us additional questions if you don't see your question replied in the FAQ. Last slide concerns the follow-up of uh, the evaluation. So once, let's say, uh, we, the, the commission has adopted the, the selection decision, SINEA will inform all applicants with a letter and the successful proposals will be invited for grant preparation that does not constitute a formal commitment for funding uh, because when we start grant preparation, there will be a number of additional checks, legal and financial checks as described uh, to be done before the grant is, uh, be before let's say the grant agreement is, uh, is finalized. Uh, when you received your evaluation uh, results, if you believe that the evaluation procedures was flawed, you can submit a complaint and uh, procedures and deadlines will be explained in the evaluation letter results. With this, I would like to thank you for, uh, for your patience uh, and for, uh, for listening for, for such a long time. Again, here, our, uh, let's say, contact, uh, in particular, our functional mailbox CNASF Energy Calls at uh, ecuropa.eu, uh, that's the official channel where we take uh, all the FAQs. Thank you, and with this, I think we stop the, we stop the presentation and we go to the Q&A session. I understand from my colleagues that, let's say, there have been already uh, a number of uh, questions uh, that uh, you put were already uh, replied in writing, so that were uh, maybe easy. But there are uh, additional ones that we want to take uh, now. Uh, we intend to reply uh, at this moment uh, or orally. So I see the one on the, on the screen. Uh, for applications that envisage only an action or project that contributes to a PCI, the applicant shall provide a project-specific CBA only for the action so uh, as I explained uh, in the slide, so the CBA, uh, it's a project specific one. And um, you will see in the call and also in the slide, if you read it more carefully, that there are specific requirements how the project specific CBA should be provided, in particular in terms of aligning with the requirements of TENI regulation. So it's not an action uh, specific CBA, but it's a PCI uh, specific uh, CBA. Maybe if there is a next one, or uh, is coming. Do you want to take? Joachim will take uh, the next one. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much for that question also. Um, so first of all, um, I think uh, important to reiterate what we said a few times <clears throat> in terms of the eligibility, um, as in previous calls, uh, the eligibility is um, comprehensive and basically all PCIs <clears throat> which are on the current list can apply um, also in the, in the current context. Now, um, when it comes to the specific policy context, um, uh, which is then, um, of course, always in particular uh, reflected in uh, the assessment of the, uh, of the urgency and priority criteria, um, I think here um, I would not um, speak about, um, you know, whether <clears throat> uh, this makes a difference between gas and electricity projects because I think it will be a more uh, comprehensive assessment which will simply look um, at how the individual project contributes to all the objectives uh, which are mentioned and which I think Raphael had put on his slide. 
um, and um, and based on that, um, the the points will be allocated for this specific criterion, which is uh, only one in five. So, um, in other words. Um, a priori, um, I do not think that we can speak of a prioritization for a specific project category um, in uh, in the current call. But again, we will look at the at the totality of criteria, and we will look at um, how the different uh, policy priorities are reflected. Um, so, I think that's what I would answer to that. Thanks, uh, Joachim. Uh this was a bit of the similar one. Uh, yeah, I, I think we replied already to the similar, a similar question. So in order to apply in the list of documents, PCI, CBA report is requested. If the project is just a part of the total PCI, what CBA is needed, again, um, as I explained before, and as it is also reported in the slide, we are talking of the PCI specific uh, uh, CBA, so not a part of the CBA. Uh, even if your application refer only to uh, a part, let's say, of the PCI, and if your application is for works, uh, then the CBA should refer to the, let's say, the CBA of the PCI as per requirements of the TENI uh, regulation. Okay, so the next question, uh, what sort of proof is required for companies which are pre-revenue? Will shareholder bank commitments be sufficient? Uh, so the reply to this question can be the following. Um, this type of documents will be uh, requested to the applicants which are, um, will, will be, let's say, positively evaluated and will be uh, selected for funding. So as I explained, uh, this will be the so-called uh, financial capacity check where uh, applicants, successful applicants, will be requested by central services and or by CINEA as well to provide, uh, uh, to provide the, the, the documentation that they have, let's say, the, fi the financial means also to, to carry out the project in combination with the SEF grant. So um, I think this is a question, let's say, cannot really prejudge now if uh, there will be a bank commitment or, uh, let's say, a shareholder commitment uh, be sufficient. I think we will have to analyze the entire, let's say, uh, proposal, uh, the role of the company in, the, in the, the role of the applicant in the application, the amount of funding. So that's, I think, uh, let's say, a question that uh, we will, let's say, be able to reply for each specific case uh, once, let's say, an application is successful. I hope that at least explains uh, the process, because we cannot say now no or yes uh, to the question. I mean, okay, I will, <clears throat> I will start, and then, Rafael, if, if you wish, um, you can uh, complete. Um, now, okay, the, the six PCI list, uh, as mentioned, is, of course, the first one under the, under the new 10E. Um, so that means, um, I mean, it doesn't mean that the process is entirely different, but, I mean, there are some adaptations to the process. There are also notably, um, of course, a number of new categories. Um, for which, um, let's say, the process uh, will not necessarily always look the same. Um, now, uh, in principle, um, I would say in reply to the first part of the question that um, the, let's say, the PCI process, properly speaking, um, will start, um, I would say, in the second half of the year, in autumn, 
um, <clears throat> that will be uh, the moment in time when we will start uh, discussing uh, also in the regional groups um, the, the different project proposals. Um, now, for you as um, uh, project promoters, um, of course, then um, it depends very much on the category under which you want to uh, you want to apply. Um, essentially, we will have, um, let's say, for the purposes of the process, two sets of categories. Um, the one uh, where application for PCI status is linked to being uh, on the TYNDP, uh, on the 10-year network uh, development plan. Essentially, uh, for electricity transmission projects, um, and then we will have a, a number of new categories uh, for which this is not the case, or I mean also the existing categories for which this wasn't the case, and we will have hydrogen for which the process is a little bit specific because we are in a transitional uh, uh, situation. Um, so without going too much into detail, um, <clears throat> for electricity where you have to be part of the TYNDP, of course the preceding TYNDP submission phase uh, has already happened, um, so that part of the process is already uh, over. Um, for the other um, categories where um, uh, permanently or on a transitional basis um, there is a possibility to apply without TYNDP status, um, we will have submission windows um, and um, they will, I think, be around autumn. I don't think we have fixed the precise date uh, for that yet, um, but we will, of course, announce them sufficiently beforehand so that you can apply. Um, I don't know, Rafael, anything to add? Or and then that's that's all we can say for now. Okay, to the question, is there any indicative content for the annual activity report? Uh, um, no, we don't uh, indicate a specific, uh, a specific content. Uh, it is, let's say, the, uh, I would say companies, uh, they prepare, let's say, these reports for their boards, for uh, shareholders. So we, we are not asking for any more specific, let's say, uh, content uh, uh, so anything that is prepared uh, for uh, for shareholders, for boards, uh, for let's say normal uh, in, in internal uh, internal control standards of companies, or uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's okay, that's sufficient. So if both studies and works are needed for the project, is it needed to submit for the same project two different applications, one for studies and one for works? The reply is yes. Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, to the first uh, part of the question, um, uh, well, no, actually, there's one question, but I think the, the question to the, uh, the answer to that is, um, is, is clearly no. I mean, there is um, the CEF call budget uh, 2022 um, is uh, the one announced. This being said, there is the usual flexibility, and, and I don't know, Beatrice, if you want to say a bit more on how much that is. Um, but uh, as far as the uh, the repower communication uh, is concerned, I mean it has of course looked into different um, into different options. 
but uh, there is at present, um, um, to say it clearly, no decision uh, to provide additional funding to, uh, to the CEF program. So certainly for this call, um, the budget is the one indicated um, with the usual flexibilities. Okay, so what are the um, member states' obligations to this project? Um, so, uh, member states, uh, the question is if the member states has to monitor, report the project in some way, and what about financial obligations? So, so the obligations of member states have changed uh, with respect to CEF-1. Uh, so, in, bear in mind that, first of all, it's the obligation of member states to uh, support, let's say, to send a letter of support or letter of agreement. Without that, the project will not be considered eligible. Uh, so that's in the application phase. When the project is uh, selected, uh, there is a such, let's say, no um, obligation of member states to, report, uh, to, to monitor because there will be an obligation on, let's say, the beneficiary to uh, report to the member state. And in terms of financial obligations, uh, there are as such no financial obligations, but at some point in time, uh, there will be, let's say, an obligation for a certification of, uh, of costs. Uh, when, the, let's say, we will come to reporting uh, uh, from the from, from the uh, from the beneficiary to to Cinea and in view of uh, uh, disbursement uh, of funds. Yeah. So the question, considering a fair distribution of the allocated budget, uh, does a maximum request for contribution exist? Even a suggested one, the reply is. No, there is no maximum request, there is no suggestion. So make sure that, uh, let's say, your application um, is, is solid, that the request for funding is well justified, that the size of your project is correct, and that really, let's say, the request for funding really reflect uh, very solidly the real funding gap of, uh, of the project. But as such, really, uh, there is no suggestion for a, for a request for contribution. So. Okay, so technical guidance of climate proofing. Uh, this guidance is relevant for environmental compliance file. Uh, actually, this is not part of the environmental compliance file, but information on climate proofing uh, comes when it, uh, let's say, in part, in part B. Uh, so it's not part as such of the environmental compliance file. Yeah, I can try. So is the application for CEF works for the project uh, uh, needs to be the exact same scope as feasibility study done under CEF studies? Um, well, the short reply can be uh, no. Uh, so you, first of all, let's say, um, let's say you are free to, I mean, design your application for, uh, for works. Um, and uh, let's say if the question is, do we have to refer to uh, the same scope of the feasibility study, I would also suggest that, uh, let's say, probably if you are applying for works, uh, your feasibility or technical studies uh, done are already mature and they are showing, let's say, a way for uh, implementation of the project. And uh, it would be good, I think, to build on, um, on the results of uh, previous, uh, previous studies uh, in your application for works to you know, consolidate 
consolidate your uh, you, you consolidate your proposal. Uh, that's uh, that's all. Uh, of course, also maybe uh, just to complement, we will also let's say in Cinea we will also look at uh, previous uh, studies financed under SEF, and uh, in particular also on the way to uh, let's say first maybe to assess a bit uh, continuity, but most of all also to um, and that's maybe a lateral uh, let's say answer. Uh, to make sure that there is no double funding uh, from, let's say, in the two applications. Uh, by shipping of chargers. Uh, so maybe it can be part of a study, if applicable. Yeah. So. The question, could CO2 transport by shipping or barges be founded by SEF in the last TENI regulation? So if we understand the last TENI regulation as the TENI regulation uh, of the current, let's say, PCI list, of the fifth PCI list, which is eligible for uh, under this call, then the reply is uh, no, if that really refers to, uh, let's say, an application for works because as such, shipping uh, is not uh, eligible under the under the TENI regulation as infrastructure category. Uh, there could be potentially scope for studying uh, shipping of CO2, potentially in complementarity with uh, 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 pipeline transport of CO2 uh, in study phase, but this will have to be really uh, assessed but uh, definitely not for works and not for projects under the fifth PCI list, which will apply here. So the question DSOs, uh, as promoter, need to submit annual activity report uh, as annexes. The reply is yes. So in case of multiple promoters from one member state, does the new form need to be filled in by each promoter? The reply is yes, because each promoter is, uh, let's say the questions on the TENI form, they are uh, promoter specific, so they are the responsibility of the promoter and not uh, the responsibility of the member state. Um, so yes, we advise you to to fill uh, to fill really per per promoter. Uh, I'm not sure exactly understand the specific question on permits of public consultation, but uh, the reply to the question to be filled in by each promoter is uh, is yes. Yeah, I think to the, I mean, also con looking, uh, consulting our colleagues uh, uh, from, from DG Energy, this, re con this question on what advising and key aspects of attention for a successful CCS project for the future PCI list, uh, we consider that this is a bit out of scope. First of all, it's a quite a broad uh, question, and it's also a bit out of scope uh, in the context of this uh, info day, so we, we prefer not to, to, to not to reply to the question. Uh, the gender will organize uh, these discussions in the in the TENI uh, regional group context. You know this? No, yeah, for business. Okay, so is there an indicative content for business plan for CO2 infrastructure projects, a plan for safe work? No, we don't have a template available for business plan for this project category. No. Okay, is an LNG production project that is not included in the current PCI list a potential candidate for a grant? through the CEF Energy pro Program. So if you are not a PCI in the current PCI list, uh, then this project uh, is excluded from funding under the current CEF Energy call. No. 
blijven wonen. Um. So, any form on transparency. So, it is required the promoter, for the promoter to publish some information on the proposal on their website. So, I understand on the project website, even though it is still only a proposal. No, there is no such a requirement uh, from any regulation to, 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 to publish information on uh, your proposal for funding. I don't remember this, we have it in the FAQ. Okay, so uh, for applicants from non-EU countries, uh, do all annexes that require signature from national competent authority have to be doubled? So letter from member state. So uh, the reply is that uh, if you are an applicant from non-EU country, uh, you will need also a letter of support from the member state, which is at least impacted by, by, the, by your project. So is there any information or request for new PCI statuses, uh, uh, in particular the PCI status for uh, H2 hydrogen projects? Uh, so Joachim already explained uh, the, up, the upcom upcoming process for new PCI list. So uh, we are, again, I mean, we are uh, getting a bit out of context uh, of the info day here, so information will be provided uh, by European Commission DG Energy. In, in due time. Okay, so we have uh, finished <laughs> with a little delay um, the info day first part. So thanks for being with us and again apologies for the delay, the slight delay caused by <laughs> the technical problem. I think we take a little, maybe five, ten minutes break and then uh, we, we reconvene at 11.30 with the second part. Thank you very much, and uh, hope it was useful. Stay, stay with us, because we have, uh, let's say, very interesting, uh, very practical, very to the point, uh, let's say, series of presentation, uh, which will be very useful for you to, to prepare a successful application. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, hello again. Uh, my name is Juan de Miguel Salanova. I'm head of sector in natural gas and carbon dioxide networks at the CEF Energy Unit at CINEA. So we will uh, continue now with the second session of this info day, where we will have uh, several presentations, more hands-on and practical, practical and oriented to uh, you as applicants, as potential applicants, to help you prepare a, a good application and a successful proposal. So first of all, uh, we will have an intervention by my colleague uh, Fivos Marias, who will uh, pre make a presentation on how to prepare a successful proposal. He will give you some useful tips and hints on how to shape your proposal. Then we will have a presentation by my colleague Ona Kostinaite Grinkevicene about how to provide data on the budget of your project your proposal. Then we will have our colleague Giulia Fraschetti from our legal team who will uh, give you an introduction to uh, the legal provisions which are important for you to be aware uh, from the grant agreement, the model grant agreement, and also generally for implementation of projects in CEF2. Uh, and finally, we will have a very practical uh, session uh, with a demonstration on how you should submit your proposal in the participants, the, fund, the funding and, and tenders portal, in the participants, uh, uh, the participants environment, 
Uh, so my colleague Christina Urpalainen Menon will walk you through uh, practically how you have to prepare and submit your application. And at the end of this session, we will have again uh, time for questions and answers. I would like to remind that you can submit your questions already to Slido with the tag Ceph Energy PCIs. And I would also like to mention that all the questions that have been asked uh, today during the session will be uh, replied in, uh, in writing. So the, all the written replies will uh, be published on, uh, on our website on the page of the, of the info day after the sessions. Uh, we will try to answer, of course, uh, all questions now during the session, but if there is any question that remains unanswered or uh, that you have missed, uh, don't worry because you will have it later on on our website. So without further introduction, I, will, I would like to give uh, the floor to my colleague Fivos for the first presentation. So Fivos, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Juan. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Fivos Marias. I am a project manager um, working for the CEF Energy unit in Sinea. Uh, so the aim of this presentation is to, to provide uh, advice and some tips uh, in order to help you prepare a, a successful proposal. Um, sorry. Okay, so the excuse me for this. Uh, so the overview of the presentation is the following one. Uh, first of all, a short introduction to the funding and tenders uh, portal. Uh, then a part on what we call terminology. Some so some definitions that will be very useful for you to fill in your uh, application. Uh, then advice and tips about the quality of your proposal, how to improve it, and how to avoid uh, some common mistakes that we have seen throughout the years. Um, uh, by applicants, and then what we call the applicant's uh, checklist. The other. The other. Okay. Excuse me again for this. Uh, so, um, since uh, this is the second time that um, the CEF Energy PCI call has joined the funding and tender portal of the European Commission, uh, it's actually a tool, a web page where you have uh, gathered all funding opportunities with the European Commission and within the tool you have one specific, um, uh, let's say, platform link uh, that we give uh, for, for PCI works and one for studies. Uh, we also provide the, the the manual, which can be very useful. And also I want to, to highlight that all templates are already embedded in the system, so you can download and uh, already start working on, uh, on them. Uh, so now moving on to, to, the, to the next part of the presentation, uh, what we call terminology, it's actually the idea is to give you uh, some help, especially for those of you who have been working with us, especially under CEF1, uh, there are some changes. Uh, so the term project uh, is used in this call and in the online tool. Uh, it's actually synonymous to the term action that we have in the CEF regulation. And action, according to the CEF regulation, uh, means any activity which has been identified as financially and technically independent, has a set time frame and is necessary for the implementation of a project. And we would like to draw your attention on, on the following point, uh, all your proposals will be part of PCI. So uh, please be very clear and explicitly mention and very clear uh, whether you refer to your specific project proposal or whether you refer to the PCI, because some elements uh, can be part of the PCI and this uh, you should make the distinction uh, clear in your proposal. That will help a lot the, the evaluation process. Uh, then we have what we call the work package, which is actually part of the Annex B. Uh, so a work package is actually the major subdivision of your project. Uh, so you can have examples of work packages uh, like a uh, work package on project management or on the preparation of the detailed design and tender documents or simply the construction of a substation. And of course work packages can run in parallel or sequential. Um, 
Now moving, let's say, a level in a level of details um, uh, lower, if I may say, uh, we have the tasks as they are uh, identified in from the print screen of Annex B. Actually, tasks are the subdivision of work packages. Uh, so within, for instance, uh, the work package project management, you may have different tasks uh, related to the coordination, to accounting or the project monitoring. And for work packages, what we call core work packages, uh, so the, the substance of your proposal, uh, you can have tasks like on the detailed documentation, the construction and acceptance uh, test of a facility. And uh, um, you need to estimate uh, in Annex B the percentage of subcontracting per each task. This is an important information that you need to, to provide. And also we, we recommend and uh, we advise to, to avoid de uh, defining subtasks. Please stay at uh, this level of, um, of definition of uh, tasks only. Uh, allow me also to, to, re to, yeah, to repeat once again that Part B has a limitation of 120 pages and uh, guidance is given in uh, all questions, I mean all the uh, points that you need uh, to fill in uh, in Part B. You have uh, information which guide you and help you to, to fill in the, the template and provide the necessary information. Uh, then we have uh, the milestones and the deliverables. So here we need to make a, a distinction. Milestones, they refer to the process. So they are the, your major control points uh, to, to process the, the progress of your uh, project. So we, we can have example of milestones like the publication of a tender or the signature of a contract or the beginning of your uh, works, um, of your construction works and deliverables, they actually refer to the content and they are the tangible outcome of your uh, project, of your work packages. And uh, they are not always linked to milestones. Uh, they can be independent, but they have to be the, ta uh, the tangible outcome. Uh, so examples of deliverables is, for instance, the documentation for, for the detailed environmental impact assessment or an engineering design or the commissioning of, of your infrastructure. Um, and then moving on, the idea is to present, a, to give a semantic representation of the notions we, we, we discussed earlier. So the, the project is composed uh, by work packages, as you can see the green are the work packages. They run in parallel or sequentially and each work, packages, work package has tasks, uh, the in orange, and then to, to monitor the, the, uh, the progress of those work packages, you have milestones uh, uh, at different time frames. And then the tangible outcome is the deliverable, uh, which is the blue um, arrow. So moving on now, uh, we would like to invite you to put yourself as if you were the evaluator and the reader of your own proposal. And uh, to help you do this, we, we need to set the framework. So as it has been explained this morning, the evaluation actually, uh, Cinea staff is involved in um, to check the completeness of your application. DGNR uh, has, um, uh, works on the policy justifications of your proposal. And then the evaluators, uh, external evaluators who do the, the bulk of the evaluation, uh, you need to keep in mind that uh, first of all, they have to evaluate um, a certain number of proposals and they have limited time. Second, uh, very often they are not English native speakers and of course they are experts in the field, but they may have limited background on your specific project. So, taking all this into account, uh, we think it's important to ask yourself what is the reader looking for. Uh, first of all, we advise you to use simple language, to avoid jargon and uh, uh, not to take any background knowledge for granted. Uh, second, it's very important uh, to be able to find easily the information. Uh, so it's uh, your responsibility to demonstrate how the proposal addresses the award criteria uh, of the call text and the, the evaluation is based only on the content that you provide. There will be no uh, follow-up questions and no assumptions are, are made. Uh, it's, uh, you have to provide some mandatory annexes 
And of course, it's very helpful to have the voluntary annexes like maps and uh, graphs. Um, so moving on now to to some additional uh, tips about the, the quality of your proposal. Uh, you need to ask yourself uh, yourselves uh, four questions. What, how, uh, who and why? So first of all, what is your project about? Uh, is it a feasibility study, for instance? Uh, do you aim to prepare the permitting documentation or to, to construct an overhead transmission line? Uh, this should be clear in your proposal. And at the same time, you need to provide the technical parameters of the project. Uh, so, for instance, if it's uh, an overhead transmission line between uh, CTX and CTY, uh, you need to, t to explain the length and also the parameters like the, the voltage. If it's about an LNG terminal, what will be the send out capacity of the, of the terminal? And even for, for studies, for instance, for a technical feasibility study for a CO2 transport infrastructure, you need again to, to, ex to give the capacity of the infrastructure. Uh, second question is how will you achieve the, the objectives of the project? And this is explained in the work packages, the tasks, the milestones and the deliverables you will describe in your, in your application. Um, then, who will carry out your project? Uh, you, will you use external resources or internal ones or both of them? Uh, this should be explained and uh, to provide the, the relevant uh, details and information. And also you need, as I said before, uh, explain and uh, estimate the percentage of, of subcontracting per work package. And of course, there are some public procurement aspects that I'm going to detail in the following slide. And finally, what is the outcome of, of your project? Why, why you, you submit this proposal? Uh, for instance, you, you want to build a double circuit uh, 320 kV overhead line. You want to commission an LNG terminal or you want to achieve the final procurement uh, documents. Or have uh, or get the approval of um, and the permitting documents. This should be uh, explicitly mentioned and clearly defined in your uh, proposal. Uh, so, the, the public procurement aspects uh, you need to keep in mind that uh, uh, all your um, actions uh, that you will carry out once you have um, uh, a contract with with Cinea, uh, they need to comply with EU uh, law. So, uh, on public procurement, you should keep in mind uh, principles like the sound financial management, uh, best value for money. Avoid any conflict of interest during uh, the tenders. Uh, have a transparent uh, public procurement procedure and, of course, equal treatment of all um, uh, applicants. And depending on your status, and this depends whether you are a public or a private entity, but it's uh, you need to 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 yeah to check the the relevant uh, EU directives and um, establish whether your proposed project is to be implemented in compliance with uh, those uh, directives. And from our uh, perspective, uh, once uh, you have a successful um, proposal and you have a grant uh, contract with Cinea, in the different payment phases, uh, we, we verify and we check uh, compliance with public procurement and uh, non-compliance with those rules can lead to rejection of costs and uh, reduction of the EU support. Um, so how it looks uh, like in, in part B of the application, uh, you have um, in part B chapter 2.2 where you are asked uh, to, we recommend to describe the planned procurement procedures. So you need to give us information about the past, the present and the future how you, you asked what has been done, I mean, regarding public procurement and what is your planning for the future. Of course, we know that this can change sometimes, but you need to give us the, the latest information at the time of, of the submission of the proposal. And again, under paragraph 6.2, you need to, to estimate the percentage of, of subcontracting per, um, per task. Um, then, now focusing on the work packages, uh, you, we advise you to have um, uh, 
clear, let's say, objective per work package. So what is the work package about? Is it about the commissioning of a substation, for instance, or to prepare the documentation for environmental impact assessment? And the objective should match the description and the name of, of the work package. Uh, we've, we've seen examples in the past we, where things were not uh, clear and that was um, uh, confusing. So, for instance, you may have work packages focusing on the detailed design and the tender documents or the construction of, uh, of a 330 kV substation. And then you need to explain for each work package uh, what are the means that you will put in place to to achieve the uh, to, to to achieve the result, uh, and how you will monitor it? So, uh, for that reason, you need to, to to define the tasks that we've said before. For instance, a task can be on the construction and acceptance test of the facilities or the supervision of the construction, and what will be the tangible outcome of your. Uh, uh, work package. Uh, so, for instance, you may have uh, your application documents uh, submitted and uh, the acknowledge from the competent authority, or um, the report um, uh, of your constructor of your uh, yeah of your contractor about the complete construction um, of uh, of an infrastructure. And then you need to set milestones. So, how you will monitor the process. Uh, during this phase and examples of, of milestones can be for instance the selection of your um, construction supervision or the fact that you have reached a center percentage of construction of your uh, pipeline. Uh, now um, moving on to the milestones um, each uh, work package uh, should have at least two milestones. One uh, milestone um, uh, at the same time of the of the beginning of the work package, and one marking the end of this work package. We also advise you for work packages lasting more than uh, uh, than 12 months to have at least one milestone every 12 months. And for milestones, you are also asked to provide means of verification, and we advise you to have reliable and realistic means of verification. Uh, this is probably too broad, so um, we, I give you some examples of what we mean as uh, realistic and uh, reliable means of verification. Uh, for instance, the written notification of the contractor, uh, it is um, a mean of verification that we, we see quite often. Uh, sometime, uh, sometimes the publication of the notice of the tender in the EU official journal, which is a simple um, link uh, once your tender is, uh, is out, uh, this is a, a mean of verification that we consider realistic and reliable. And for instance, it can be also the, the, approved, the approved contractor's progress report. Um, so in your application, this is how it will uh, look like. You will have a work package, for instance, for a study about the preparation, a submission of planning um, application to the competent authority. And uh, you are asked to fill in an indicative uh, start and end date. And at the same time, for work packages, you have corresponding milestones uh, where you are asked to give the description, the summary, uh, means of verification and the due date. And we advise you to pay attention uh, so that all data matches. So what we mean is that uh, when we say about um, data that match, it's important, for instance, the due date of the first milestone to correspond to the uh, start date of the work package. And similarly, the end date of the work package should match uh, with the due date of the, other, of the final milestone. Uh, now an example uh, from a works action, so uh, the objective was the construction of, of a transmission line. Uh, this is a work package, uh, for instance, lasting more than 12 months, so we suggest to have an additional milestone. So there is milestone one uh, with the same due date as the uh, start date of your work package. Milestone three, uh, marking the end date of, of construction and the end date of um, of this work package with uh, the corresponding due date uh, of milestone three. And then we have milestone two uh, in, in between uh, to, to help you 
first of all, and also help us uh, monitor the progress of your uh, of your activities. Um, and so, an advice we want to to give you is that uh, we believe that you need to have a common thread, a common direction, uh, which will run throughout your your proposal, combining the objectives, uh, the work packages, the resources, uh, and the planning that you have in mind and that you will put in in place. And all of this should be coherent uh, in order to achieve your uh, your objectives, your tangible outcomes, uh, which are the deliverables. Uh, so you will provide us uh, the GAN chart and uh, please pay attention, uh, information given in the GAN chart should be consistent with information that you give in, uh, in the other parts of the application. And this is important for all documents that you, you will provide, uh, information should uh, match. Um, uh, this is uh, important because if there are contradictions between the supporting documents and uh, application in, and parts of your application, for instance, Part B, uh, that can be very confusing for evaluators. And at the same time, we advise you to keep your your proposals um, concise uh, and also to to try to avoid the repetitions. Uh, the templates are um, they give uh, explicit uh, guidance and information on the on on the information that is required uh, for each uh, chapter. Uh, so please follow the the template, uh, fill in with information needed, avoid repetitions, and present your information and your uh, proposal in a logical way. So what we mean. First of all, the administrative procedures, for instance, uh, we advise you to present them in a chronological order uh, in the work package table. Uh, then, of course, if you want to to have a, to to achieve to yeah to construct and build an infrastructure, uh, you need first of all the environmental impact assessment. So please present uh, things in a logical order. And then you, for instance, you want to focus on the on the design study. This study always starts after finalization of the basic uh, study. Uh, so this is an example uh, of the type of information that you are asked to provide uh, in um, regarding the authorizations and things I mentioned before. Uh, so it's in part B. Chapter two, uh, paragraph 2.2. Uh, so once again, we ask you to give us information about the past, the present, and the future. Uh, so um, to explain what has been done and to give us the the, the estimated timeline that you have uh, for the future for um, um, uh, receiving the approvals and the permits uh, which are pending. Uh, and now. Some some counter examples that we've seen in 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 past applications to help you improve uh, uh, your proposals. Um, it it is important to to justify the resources that you allocate to the completion of a certain uh, um, uh, task work package uh, with the scope of of the work package, for instance. So an example, uh, the objective is to build a, a substation and in the application it's mentioned that you need, uh, that you will allocate two staff members, but it's important to explain what these people are going to work on. Is it going to be only for the construction management or is it going to be uh, um, those two people who are going to do the, the construction works? Uh, so similarly, for a feasibility study, uh, there is an allocation again of two staff members, but again, what for? Uh, these two people, are they going to coordinate the inputs from contractors or are they going to make the complex technical analysis themselves? Uh, the appreciation, as you understand, is uh, completely different uh, of this figure of the two staff members depending on the, on the scope and the extent of their work. Um, And now we move on to the last part of the of the presentation. Uh, so what we call the checklist. Uh, pay attention and um, um, 
check whether the the content and the scope of your project of your proposal um, falls in the scope of the 2022 call for proposal uh, this is very important also you need to submit your application on time and we advise you to avoid submitting in the very last uh, day uh, Ask yourselves before finalizing your application whether you have encoded uh, part A, uh, whether part B has been encoded and you can print it and uh, upload it in a Word uh, document. Uh, also, uh, there are some annexes that you need, the man mandatory annexes that you need to, to fill in and to upload. And also whether you have uh, uh, filled in the business plan and the separate calculation model which is not mandatory but uh, recommended and finally pr proofread your your proposal uh, and remember that the evaluators will only assess your proposal on the basis of the information that you have provided no assumption is made and no request for uh, for additional information is made and um, be, uh, make sure that your proposal is precise uh, clear and it corresponds to the um, to the criteria set, it, it, I mean, it addresses all criteria. Uh, and make sure that you submit your proposal with uh, the, applica the, the, the corresponding applica um, application forms. And um, you can follow us on uh, the different um, social media. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fibos, for these very useful tips and hints. I'm sure uh, our applicants have uh, really appreciated to get your guidance. And now we will move on to the next intervention, which is by my colleague Ona, who will guide you through how you have to encode information on budget and costs in your proposals. So Ona, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Thanks, Juan, and thanks for presentation. So uh, my idea is actually to walk you through the budget management in the proposal. And I would like actually to start with the costs. So first of all, before uh, you actually start encoding any kind of budget information or the uh, requested EU contribution, I would advise you to think about your cost. And you can start with actually checking the call text uh, here in the slide, I made a reference where exactly uh, you can find the detailed information. So it's in uh, section 10 of the call text under the part budget categories and cost eligibility uh, rules. There you will find the detailed setup of the uh, potentially uh, um, relevant cost for you in terms of budget categories and uh, eligibility. Uh, another tip I want to add you that we are talking only about actual costs. So if you have a contract, then this is actual cost, which is supposed to be. And only in case of personal cost, we have an option, so it's a possibility, to have average costs for personnel. Again, I want to reiterate from the um, questions we received, and uh, as my colleagues already said in the first part of this info day, we do not mix study and works proposals. So in case you have an uh, option to uh, apply, it's one is for studies and another one is for works. So under works proposals, we cannot have studies. And I really invite you to look into FAQs, which we currently have already published, where you will have more examples. What is the difference between study and works proposal? Now, once you have these uh, elements settled, uh, you need to go a bit deeper in the cost and basically decide uh, whether it's eligible or not eligible cost. On the screen, you have a couple of examples of not eligible costs, and I really invite you to look through those. In particular, VAT, um, any cost with land acquisition or easement, they are not eligible uh, under the call um, text. So please do uh, take that into account when you pre prepare your application. The same also applies for indirect costs. An example, for example, you need to do, or I don't know, to construct an electricity line from point A to point B, and for that purpose you decide to buy uh, a car. 
So this is indirect cost and it's not eligible uh, under this call. Uh, I also want to uh, reply to one of the questions which we see uh, um, quite often in, 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 in our uh, Slido. It relates to the cost of procurement. So in principle, you are uh, fully um, allowed to launch your procurement or tender, uh, tender document specifications before actually uh, the, even the proposal is submitted. However, I want to draw your attention that the cost eligibility is defined as per the earliest possible date, which is the submission of the proposal. So in case you submitted your proposal on the 1st of September 2022, which is the deadline for this call, this is the earliest possible date when the cost can be eligible if your proposal is successful. So any cost related to the actual procurement, like preparation, as I said, to tender the documentation, then in those cases, this cost will not be um, eligible. However, if you include procurement tender within the eligibility period of your proposal, then the, those costs might be considered as eligible. Again, you can do procurement before the uh, project starts. So the contracts which you sign we work on the cost incurred principle, which means that if you deliver the goods on site and it is during the grant agreement eligibility period, those costs are perfectly eligible. Now, once you decide on these costs, right, you, you have them clearly in your mind, next step is actually to step in and go to the um, requirements for the proposals related to the budget. And here I want to um, mention that we have two tables, we call them tables, where you need to encode a budget-related information. So the first one is a budget breakdown per cost category, and the second one is a budget table per work package. And again, as I think it is very uh, um, clearly it was already communicated to you, both uh, tables are mandatory and they to be encoded and submitted with each proposal. Now, I will try to go a bit in depth into each of these uh, categories to walk you through and give some tips how to fill them in. So, let's start with uh, detailed budget uh, breakdown per cost category. Uh, don't worry, it looks very small, it looks very big. Um, this is a snapshot, example, how this table looks like in the tool. And in the next slides, I will try to break this table down, actually in two slides, to walk you through and explain a bit uh, what exactly is in, uh, applicable for Ceph Energy PCI's call, because not all parts are applicable, and I would really appreciate your attention on that in order to avoid any misunderstandings and uh, um, negative uh, decisions for your uh, application. So, the first part of this um, uh, uh, table. Now, the, I will start with the funding rate. So funding rate is fixed. You have 50. And this is for studies and this is for works. So in both cases you have 50. You cannot go for lower, you cannot go for uh, higher for studies. However, as I think my colleague Beatrice explained in the first part of InfoDay, exceptionally for works, there is the possibility to ask for 75% uh, co-funding rate. Again, this is fixed. So either 50 or 75. For studies, it's only 50. Then we have certain um, columns which are not applicable for uh, this call. And I marked them uh, there as, uh, like for example, a financial support to the third uh, parties, uh, land purchase, indirect costs. Right? Visa, again, are explained in the call text. Then, again, repeat, repetition, F studies for works proposals are not applicable, so you cannot have here basically uh, any amount. And then we have uh, two elements, so synergetic elements or works in the outmost regions were if applicable. So in case your proposal indeed covers synergetic elements, which you explain in a part B, 
you may encode here cost, which will be scrutinized and, 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 and assessed during the um, assessment of your proposal. For works in the outermost regions, the point is that currently we do not have any related PCI. So theoretically, it's applicable, but in reality, for this call, for the fifth PCI list, this uh, uh, column shall not be uh, encoded. Now, again, I'm continuing the, the break of this uh, uh, big table, and here, again, I want to reiterate, fixed rates, so either 50 or 75. And then the table uh, really calculates quite a lot uh, automatically. So, to sum up, this is a structured financial information. You directly encode cost categories in the funding and tenders portal, and my colleague Christina later on will show you how it looks like. This table is encoded per participant and per affiliated entity, so meaning coordinator, uh, applicant, and any affiliated entity you might have. Uh, here is a please a warning on a, uh, and a request for the attention. Uh, um, my colleague Julia will explain what is affiliated entity, and um, in the next presentation, and you really need to decide whether the, any entity you want to encode is an affiliated entity before starting encoding. And then uh, repetition: 50% co-funding rate is a fixed one. If for works you have an, a possibility um, to ask for 75, again, it relates to significant positive externalities, and it's only for electricity and gas works proposals. So this is the cost category budget uh, table. I also want to um, bring in a bit different uh, um, perspective to this, because I saw some questions uh, related to the, to the cost. So first of all, is like this cost which you need to encode is a personnel, subcontracting, purchase, other costs, and indirect costs. As I said, some of them are not applicable for this call. So be warned and please make sure that you correctly have data in your budget uh, table. And then uh, I want to go a bit in depth into the costs which are um, eligible and which you really need to think about. So first of all, the personal cost. You have three options. Either it's an employee, it's a natural person under the direct contract, or it's seconded persons. All these um, terms are, are quite uh, self-explanatory. So either you have someone on, 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 a, on, a, on a salary slip, you have a direct contract with some natural person, or there's a seconded one from another organization. In each case, you need to encode costs related to that, if any. Here is a warning. Um, under the call tax, it is very clearly spelled out that project management costs cannot exceed 10%. And in case there is a, a higher limit, then it will be uh, rejected. Subcontracting costs. First of all, I want to um, reply to the question which I've seen on, 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 on Slido, that there is no earmarked percentage for subcontracting. If there is a situation that you need 100% subcontracting, then you need to encode that and subsequently explain in part uh, B. And examples are very simple, right? So you have or you plan to have a contract with someone, a third party, to provide you certain uh, uh, services or works. And then I uh, cannot really reinforce the message which my colleague Fivos did before that public procurement rules or sound financial management rules, which are like procurement principles, shall be really uh, applied to fully for subcontracting. So basically, you cannot uh, give a, a contract directly just because, yeah, they, this is a very good friend of yours. And then we go to purchase costs. So this purchase cost is not subcontracting. As you see, we have uh, three categories there. So travel and substance, uh, equipment. For example, you need some kind of asset to, to, to be purchased for, for this implementation of your proposed project. And any other goods, consumables, suppliers. Um, again, um, not knowing exactly what the scope of your project is, I cannot specifically advise or give uh, clear uh, you know, um, guidance on this or that. Uh, I would really invite you to look into the uh, FAQs. There are some, some, some uh, hints there, but at the same time, this is a common sense, right? You do contract someone, this is a subcontracting. If you purchase it yourself, then it is a purchase cost. Now, um, 
we finished with the cost um, category table and now I'm moving to a second table, which is a per work package. And this is downloadable, so there is a, a POR Excel which you can download from a submission system. It's obligatory to be filled in and we call it unstructured information. The basis of this cost is a per work package. So you can have as many work packages as you wish, as long as they uh, fulfill the requirements as explained by Thivos in a previous uh, presentation. And I really uh, encourage you before filling in this uh, work package uh, table to read instructions in the first uh, sheet. Now, um, I already kind of covered a lot for, for, for this budget uh, table per work package, some highlights. The first thing that you need to encode it per participant, including affiliated entity if it is applicable, and per reporting period. And reporting periods are actually by standard is 24 months. So if you have your um, proposal uh, saying that you want to start on the 1st of January 2023, then the first uh, uh, reporting period it will be in two years. And in, the in this slide, I also give a couple of examples how reporting periods could look like. Uh, then uh, we go to um, the table itself where I want to uh, highlight a couple of things. The first thing is that you really need to fill in uh, only the information in the white cells. So gray cells will be filled in automatically and as per the previous call we saw that uh, people start modifying the table. Please do not modify the table. Uh, the table is really constructed in such a way that it helps you to get the data right because if it's not consistent with the arrest of application, as, as Fiva said, we might have a problem uh, and then there is an inconsistency and, and lower uh, quality application. And in step five, which you see here, is the um, amounts which you need to encode. These should come from uh, funding and tenders portal, budget table per cost category. So there should be no inconsistencies in your tables and you really need to uh, make sure that yourself. Now, to sum up, right? Uh, what is important for you to uh, consider is that all costs shall match between those two tables, you need to have a clear and structured uh, consistency. In case there is an inconsistency, we will take the uh, cost category table as the one prevailing. And as you strongly believe in your success, I would really advise you already now to prepare your accounting system because any cost which you foresee to be claimed for EU uh, grant, then we need already to be very clearly marked in your accounting system. With that, I uh, finish my uh, presentation and looking forward for questions. Thanks. Many thanks, Anna, for your very clear presentation. Uh, information on budget and costs is a key part of your application, so please make sure that you encode it uh, correctly, as it was just explained. Uh, the next intervention will be from my colleague, Julia, who will uh, walk you through the main provisions of uh, the... You have to press again, yeah. because you can't see. Sorry. So the next intervention is by my colleague Julia from our legal uh, team and she will walk you through the main provisions of the model grant agreement and very important aspects you have to take into account to implement your action if it's uh, successfully uh, selected. So please Julia, the floor is yours, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Giulia Fraschetti. I am a member of the legal team in Unit A2 in Cinea. So uh, the point of my presentation is to explain to you the main legal provisions of our grant agreement. Um, as you, what is the grant agreement? Uh, 
it is basically a contract that you will sign with us, which will list from one end your rights, and so meaning the EU funding that you will receive, the fact that you will own the results, and of course to, that, for example, you will be allowed to request for amendment in case of need about the, uh, the amendment request that we'll uh, uh, talk uh, later on. But of course, when we talk about rights, we have to talk about obligations, meaning your obligation in implementing the project. First of all, you will be required to uh, implement the project in line with what it was agreed under the Annex 1 of your um, grant amendment to submit report and about the report requirements we also will talk later on and to comply with the uh, communication and um, requirements. Um, most importantly for you, the grant amendment will specify how much money you will get, knowing that you will never be refunded more than the maximum grant amount which was agreed and so fixed in the grant agreement, but we may pay less in case uh, the project cost will be less than those that were initially planned. How does it look like? Well, uh, as my colleagues previously mentioned, everything is managed through the e-grant system. So uh, this kind of uh, IT management should make your life easier, meaning that uh, you will be requested to sign the relevant document directly in the system, and you will find all the templates and important information that my colleagues talk about in the system. The structure was uh, discussed and then agreed with the Commission services, meaning our legal service. So this is a corporate model. It's a sort of template which has been adjusted, of course, to the need of our program and our call. And so it is composed by a core part where you will find all the most relevant legal provisions and then several annexes. And I would invite you to spend some more time in reading the Annex 5 because it is the one which provides provides with more details information on certain legal provisions. Um, I made some examples, but uh, I would say, for example, for the uh, communication and dissemination activities, you will find very detailed information about what it should be done, uh, what it means, for example, intellectual property rights, uh, for security requirements, and of course, uh, member state information and durability. Okay, so uh, who will participate in the grant agreement, meaning who will sign this uh, contract? You all are potential participants for us, and then once you will sign the grant agreement, you will uh, have a different uh, role. And so here today, I will talk to you more in, the, uh, in depth about um, the role of beneficiary, affiliated entities, and then associated partner. Let's start with the definition of a beneficiary. So, of course, the beneficiary signs the grant agreement and have all the rights and obligations that I briefly uh, explained to you during the first slides. If uh, there are several beneficiaries, always mandatory to designate a coordinator, which is the one who will deal with us, who will uh, submit all the report and have all the communications uh, uh, with us. So um, it's a very important the role of a coordinator. Um, please note that in case the beneficiary uh, that are not coordinated, they must accede to the grant by signing the accession form, which is the Annex 3, which is, can be easily downloaded by our, from our portla, portal within 30 days after the entry into force of the agreement. Most importantly, each beneficiary is responsible for the affiliated entity or the associated partner, which is um, assign, it's uh, kind of linked to the beneficiary because each affiliated entity, associated party should be linked to one beneficiary and then uh, so they work under the responsibility of the beneficiary. But th these two entities have completely different roles. Let's start with the affiliated entity. So first of all, what, what do they are? 
they are entities having a legal and capital link with the beneficiary, but this link should not be limited to um, the implementation of the action or just uh, um, established for, uh, for, the, for its implementation. They participate in the action with very similar rights to the beneficiary and very similar obligations are the, as the beneficiary. They must implement the action in line with um, uh, the task uh, descri described under the Annex 1 of uh, the grant agreement. Most importantly, they do not have access to the IT portal uh, My Area. And, uh, and for the rest, in order to be eligible, they need to comply with the same eligibility criteria set under the call, which are those we will check while screening the beneficiaries. Associated parties are different because when we talk about associated party, we talk about entities. They do, they do implement the action tasks, but they do not receive any EU funding. So once again, they have to implement their tasks uh, in line with what is described in the Annex 1, but their costs, is, they are not eligible. And so uh, they do participate in the action, yes, but they don't have the same rights as the beneficiary, but they have the same obligations. And once again, they have to be linked to a beneficiary, but they could be linked also to the consortium. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the concept of affiliated entity and uh, associated partner, because I think it might be relevant for you while implementing your action. So we were saying that an affiliated entity has a very a permanent capital and legal link uh, with the beneficiary, which cannot be limited to the project. And um, for capital links, we have to think that it covers also the situation where the affiliated entity is under the same direct or indirect control of the beneficiary. Let's make an example to try to be more clear. Let's think about the company A and company B. Company B do not, that do not control each other, but they, they are both, these two companies, under the ownership of company C. So company A can be our beneficiary, while company B could implement um, our action uh, because it's, kind, it's linked to company A, so it could be an affiliated entity. What about the associated partner? So we know that the associated partner, they do not sign the grant agreement, so they do not become a party of um, this uh, grant agreement, but we know that they must uh, implement important part of the action, so they're fully involved in our uh, consortium. The reason why a consortium or a beneficiary might have an interest to add an associated part an associated partner is because maybe this entity could gain, uh, could have an interest in gaining visibility while participating in our action or for uh, scientific um, needs. But going to the example, we have to think what this is an example a little bit different. So we can think about a company A, which is established, let's say, in Germany, but they could be in any member states, which is the beneficiary of our grants. A owns company B, which is a French company, and also, also a company C, which is based, in my example, in a US company, but we could say in any um, third country. Let's say that company B and C could be a considered affiliated to A. However, uh, company uh, C could participate only as an affiliated entity to A. Why? Because it's, est it's established in a third country, so it should not be considered as eligible. So in this case, it could participate as an associated uh, partner. Uh, going back to the roles, to the internal roles in a consortium, 
uh, it is important to make a distinction between the role of the coordinator and the uh, beneficiary. So as I was saying before, the coordinator is the one dealing with any kind of communications with us, uh, with the agency, so is the one who will submit the pre-financing guarantees, who will request and review any documents uh, uh, required, they will, um, will submit the deliverables and report to Sinea and inform Sinea about the payment uh, made. So for us, it's, it's really our uh, main content point. Most importantly, the coordinator is in charge to monitor the full implementation of the action and then to distribute the payment received from Sinea to all the beneficiaries, of course, without any delay. Uh, beneficiaries have also some uh, obligations because they have to keep up to date all the information stored in our uh, IT system and inform Cinea of any kind of events and circumstances that could um, delay the implementation of uh, uh, the action. Um, they have to submit to the coordinator, of course, the pre-financing guarantees, the financial statements, the contribution to the deliverables and the technical reports or any other documents which are important and so then requested in the grant agreement. And or they have to submit uh, via the portal all the data relevant documents related to the affiliated entity. About reporting that I briefly mentioned before, uh, please remember that reporting is uh, a legal obligation um, which cannot be skipped by any reason. Um, about the reporting period, you should notice that the action duration is divided into one or more reporting periods which serve as a basis for reporting requirements. The language of the reporting is, of course, English, as it is the language of our grant agreement. When talking about reporting, we should make a distinction between two kinds of reporting. From one end, we have what we so-called the continuous reporting, and from the other hand, the uh, periodic reporting. reporting. Uh, for uh, the continuous reporting, we refer, well, um, to the obligations that beneficiary have to report to us on the progress of the action. So any deliverables, milestones, uh, output and outcomes, this will all be done, of course, throughout the system where you will have a specific tool. And the standardized deliverables must be submitted also using the templates published on the portal. However, the periodic reporting are different because these are those you need to submit in order to get paid. So it's a very important uh, factor for you. When we talk about periodic reports, we must, we, we must distinct, make a distinction because they include a technical part and a financial part. And while the technical part gives an overview of the action implementation, the financial part concerns the financial statements, use of resources, and the certificates of the uh, financial statements. Please be aware that you have a strict deadline for the submission of those reports, which is 60 days after the end of the reporting period. Uh, Align with the reporting obligation, uh, there is uh, the member states information, uh, which is also an obligation that beneficiary have detailed under Annex 5. And then uh, because um, beneficiary uh, must keep the, the concern member states informed about the progress of the action implementation, meaning that this report should be transmitted to them via email or maybe giving to them a specific access to the portal tool and so they will be uh, able to, uh, to have access to those um, report. Um, 
Moving to payments. So we said that reportings are connected to payment. This means that a beneficiary can be paid once the periodic report is submitted within the deadline and so then is allowed also to submit a request for payment, which will be made to the coordinator. When we talk about payments, we, ha we can make a distinction between the three main uh, different kind of payments. We have the pre-financing payment, the interim payment, and the payment of the final balance. The pre-financing payment is the one paid within 30 days from the entry into force of the agreement, and so it's basically the first tranche of payment to start implementing your project. For the interim payments, uh, these are paid within 90 days from receiving your periodic report. And these payments, they go to reimburse the eligible cost uh, claimed during the uh, reporting period. And of course, uh, they are subject to the approval of your um, periodic report. And so the approval also of the um, reporting period. And then you have the payment of the balance, which is the final payment that you will receive at the very end of the implementation of the project, which will reimburse the remaining part of the budget. Of course, um, for budget meaning the eligible cost claimed by you for the implementation of the action and uh, will be paid uh, within 90 days from receiving the periodic report. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I have the feeling I spent too much time maybe to talk to you about reporting. I don't want to bother you too much. Something very important to put your attention on is, is the amendment. Um, you have the possibility to request an amendment in case any circumstances or event will change during the implementation of the actions. Of course, all the amendment requests must be duly justified, uh, made through the portal, um, and uh, they will be assessed, analyzed uh, by us. Please bear in mind that uh, the grant agreement can be modified only while it is into force, and of course, before the payment of the final balance. These are the most important information on the amendments, and then I invite you to check carefully Article 39 to better understand how does it work. Uh, when we talk at the very beginning about the communication, I told you this is uh, your obligation, which means that you have to make sure to inform the public about the EU funding received by us, uh, putting, um, presenting your project on your website, uh, social media accounts, displaying um, our public support and plaques and the billboard, and always reminding to upload uh, the project results in the, the platform. And then um, I just wanted to briefly mention to you the institutions of suspension, termination, and reduction of the grant, uh, the grant amount, because but you, as a beneficiary, you can suspend the action in exceptional circumstances, mainly due to a force majeure, or, or terminate the action in duly justified cases. Um, but please note that we, as an agency, can also suspend, terminate, or reduce the grant amount for several reasons, like, for example, in case we detect errors, irregularity, fraud, or in case of breach or your obligation under the grant uh, agreement. So my presentation, uh, it's over now. So I hope you found it useful, and uh, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much indeed, Julia, for your very detailed presentation, very important provisions that our applicants need to be aware of. And we, we move on now to the next and last intervention by my colleague Christina, who will walk you uh, hands-on on how to prepare and submit your application in the funding and tenders portal. So please, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Juan. Um, so. Um, I will go very quickly on uh, just showing you the basic functions of the of the funding and tender portal. So uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's called Cedia, and this is uh, the portal where all the funding tenders grants of the European Commission are gathered. And this is why we also transferred into this system uh, a year ago. So you have all the links available in the call page uh, in the information of this um, of this info day. But if not, you can search this call by, for example, CFE, 
22 PCI. And this is the call basically. And then you, uh, you go into the call page. It looks a little bit complicated, but it's not that complicated actually. So here you have the call deadlines. And, and we have two different calls. So works and studies are different calls. So in the course of this, I will show you how you can go back and forth and save and change. Um, the only thing you cannot change is that if you start your uh, proposal as works, you cannot change it into studies. In the meanwhile, you need to start a new proposal. So here we are, topic description. This is actually the same text as you will then find in the Almighty Bible of the call document, which looks like this. So this is where all the legalese of the call funding rates, uh, funding conditions that Ona mentioned is, is here. Um, and here you have a little bit of uh, the description of uh, what you can find where. Um, the application forms, templates, you can find links here, but the, the actual templates, the fillable ones, these are just samples you can find in the, um, in the call itself. So, then uh, start submission. We go down, uh, we choose, we want to start a submission on a works proposal. Da da da, are you sure? You confirm. And then maybe hopefully, I already created a proposal. Well, um, as um, before that, of course, you need to be registered as a uh, if the system doesn't recognize you, it knows my name since I, I'm up and down here all the time. If the system doesn't know who you are, it'll ask you to register. It'll maybe match you with, uh, uh, with an organization and help for all that kind of things. You will find in, um, if you haven't done this before, there is support available here, guidance. At this stage, there's not that much help that you otherwise need, but maybe for registering the participant, that might be an issue. So we have, um, we are here, we've uh, started a proposal, and here you can find again, da, 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 you're in works, and now here, this is where you can find the actual templates, and you can download them, and here they come in, um, in you can find the actual Word version, Excel versions of uh, of the dif different templates that you need. You will also find uh, links to the online manual, IT how-to FAQs, and the IT help desk. Uh, that's very, diff uh, very important. When you have a bug in a system, you don't know how to get it uh, advanced, or it looks like the system is just doing something uh, weird, email or call the IT help desk. Uh, they're the only ones that can help you in that one. And I forgot to mention, on this much mentioned call page, the much mentioned FAQs, here where you find, you just go down. You, we have the list of all the FAQs that we have here already. You can search them by keywords, so let's say CBA, for example, and it gives you the um, FAQs that are already been written for that. So, starting an application. First, you need to find your organization. Uh, these are my colleagues from the IT department, so uh, these are kind of mock proposal types, just to show you. So I've chosen one of them, and I've added as the main contact. You write an acronym, you uh, write a short summary, you save and go to the next step. So be aware that the organization is going to be notified. Yes, and here you agree that uh, we see the pre-registration information, uh, please, keep this uh, default choice. Uh, we'll just basically see the, the um, kind of very short abstract of your proposal, but that's good for us to, to know, um, uh, to be able to search experts in advance. We continue with this proposal. We can add more contacts. We can add affiliated entities. We can fill in um, different kind of access rights for the, for the participate, uh, participants. Right now, I'm not going to add anything else. Here's where you download the Part B template. And with our one participant, we will go on. Turning a little bit. You can always go back. You can go to the ne to next stage. Um, 
you can modify your participants. So this is kind of the gist of the, uh, of the proposal. The much spoken about administrative forms part A structured information is here and the annexes you upload here. So if we start with the structured information, you do edit forms. And you will have here. Um, so you can go through general information where you fill in the, the duration of your proposal. You choose the PCI. Uh, then it should, in principle, um, pre-show you the energy sector priority corridor. You fill in the abstract. You go into participants and contacts. You fill in the information for participants. There, just contact information. Da, 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 da. Budget, so this is the structured part of the budget uh, that Ona showed in her, in her slides. And you can see that this is a very, very long table, but you can just fill directly in here and it'll calculate. Uh, we have other questions. Synergies, uh, filling in the member states uh, where the action will be uh, will be implemented. Uh, you can always validate in, in between, and the system will tell you where you have a blocking lack of information, so uh, you cannot submit if you still have red, uh, red blocks in here. Exit form. So basically, you can always, you can, you can save, move on, and come back to this. As soon as you create the proposal, it'll send you a, um, um, uh, um, an email with the link to your proposal, and you can always find it under my under the participant portal under my um, under my proposals. And then finally, just the annexes. So this is where you upload the different annexes. The red color here means that it's a, it's an obligatory annex, but don't trust that if it doesn't show ob, uh, red color as an obligatory annex, check from the call document. This might be an obligatory annex for you, anyway. Here you can see what kind of a what kind of a um, file type you're supposed to uh, upload and uh, sometimes there's a, or there is a maximum size of the file. You upload all the files and basically you submit or you can keep going back. You can keep doing this uh, sub, uh, saving. You can even submit and then reopen the proposal as many times as you want, but just make sure that it is at the submitted stage before the, um, before the call deadline. And, well, very briefly, but I, I think this is the main gist of it. It's not that complicated. Um, feel free to experiment and remember to save. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Very useful presentation. And with this, we have concluded all the interventions. So now we have still some time for questions and answers. We have been receiving a number of questions already since this morning. So now we will try to address them all and cover all the topics on which uh, you have submitted your, your queries. Okay, the first question I'm seeing on screen. Is there a limited time frame for ending the project in the scope of SEF studies? Do we need to finish our studies within, for example, two years? The answer is no. There is no specific uh, limited time frame to conclude uh, an action for studies. Uh, the absolute deadline to conclude actions under this call is the uh, is 31st December 2028, which is mostly meant for works proposals. For studies, no specific deadline, but you have to take into account that the duration of your action will be uh, taken into account when evaluating the maturity criterion. So you have to be able to complete the action within a reasonable time frame, but no specific limit set laid down in the call. Next question, can public tenders be launched before the sub submission deadline? My colleague Ona already mentioned this in her presentation, so the answer is yes. Tenders can be launched before the submission deadline, but please be aware that any costs incurred before the start date of the action are not eligible. 
the start date of the action will be set uh, set in your proposal, but will, will also be set in the grant agreement if your proposal is selected for funding. Any costs before this date, which at the earliest is the date of submission of your proposal, would not be eligible. And please be aware as well that you have to comply with all the rules and conditions that are established in the grant agreement in relation to tenders. So you have to respect uh, sound financial management principles, best value for money, and if applicable, you have to carry out your procurements in line with uh, public procurement rules in your country, according to the directives. Next question, does the action need to be exactly in line with the PCA scope descrip description? Yes, the action needs to be fully in scope with the PCI or PCIs to which it relates. If there is any deviation because the project has uh, been updated in any of the technical characteristics, please explain that in your proposal. But in principle, it should not deviate at all from the PCA scope. In the call for studies, what part of the budget is to be filled in the cost category studies since actually the full costs relate to studies? I'll hand it over to Ona for this one. Yeah, thanks for the question. So in case we have a proposal for studies and there is a cost category for studies, but basically uh, you really need to think uh, a bit outside. So in case you have a study which will be contracted to a third party as I explained before, then it is a subcontracting cost. If you have your own study to be done, so within resources of, of your company, it, it could be either it's a study, so an under cost category of study, or it's a personal cost, because the question is how you're going to do that. Uh, what will be your uh, practices in, in, in the organization? Will you pay salaries to certain people in, inside your organization when it will be personal costs? Or they will be assigned to do that and they will get, for example, a clear amount for that given study. So again, depends on what kind of rearrangements you're going to do, what kind of cost you plan. Uh, subsequently, the filling of the budget uh, category table uh, will be applicable. Next question. The revised tenure regulation is expected to include costs for permanent storage for works applications in this call. Will this broadening of costs allowed? So in our understanding, this question may refer to costs for uh, hydro pump storage. If, it, if that's the case, the answer is no. They're not eligible for works under this call because this call is still based on the uh, previously enforced uh, tenure regulation, which was uh, the, the regulation that was uh, the basis for the current PCI list. And if the question relates, on the other hand, to uh, geological storage of CO2, the answer is the same. It's not eligible under this call because this call is still based in the previous tenure regulation. So anything from the new tenure regulation, which is different from the previous one, is not, uh, is not eligible for this call for proposals. Please, could you explain again the difference between action project under self regulation and a PCI under tenure regulation? For me, it would be the same. So, uh, in the meaning of CEF, action and project are synonyms in the framework of your application. You apply for an action or for a project, it's the same. Uh, and uh, there is uh, a different concept, which is the project, project of common interest under the tenure regulation identified in the fifth PCI list. So, your action or your project in your proposal may relate to part of a PCI or to an entire PCI. I hope this answer is clear. Next question, is the application considered eligible and ensuring effective implementation of PCI if the applicant is an affiliated entity that owns and will operate it? So I will refer here to the information that my colleague Julia provided before. She explained in detail what an affiliated entity is, the difference with an associated partner in the application. So basically, it is possible to include um, in your applications affiliated entities as long as they are in involved in the action implementation and they incur costs. So yes, the, it is possible for um, that an applicant is an affiliated entity. 
And just bear in mind that if uh, the entire action would be implemented by this affiliated entity, uh, this entity would have to demonstrate the operational and financial capacity. So would need to submit documents to prove operational capacity and also to prove the financial capacity to be able to carry out the entire action. You may also consider to have this affiliated entity included in the, in the application just as, uh, like another applicant. And in that case, it would be it would become a beneficiary in the grant agreement with, with full rights and obligations. Next question, can actions be funded if their execution starting date is subsequent to CEF submittal, but previous contracts have options which have never been activated before? So this is a bit related to what we already uh, clarified before. So the action, um, has a start date. The start date of the action is at the earliest, the submission date of the proposal. If uh, there are previous contracts established before this start date, uh, you would have to take into account that this contracting needs to comply with the rules that are, are established in the grant agreement in terms of sounds financial management and, if applicable, uh, public procurement rules. So if there are contra contracts that are pre-existing the application and you intend to make use of those or activate them, please be aware that, first of all, you have to comply with these rules, some financial management, public procurement, if applicable, and any costs before the start date of the action are not eligible. Can you indicate, as more exactly as possible, the most likely date month of 2023 of the grant agreement signature, start of the approved projects, June 2023. So as my uh, colleague Beatrice explained this morning, uh, the call closure is 1st of, of September. Evaluations will take place until November or December. Uh, information to successful applicants will be probably early next year. And the uh, final deadline for uh, signing of grant agreements will be until the 1st of June next year or beginning of June next year. So most likely, the, the signing of uh, grant agreements will take place in the first, second quarter of next year. For a beneficiary private entity that does not ask for a grant higher than 50% is allowed using usual purchasing practices, purchases with, purchases with best value for money, so first of all, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't matter uh, what the funding rate is. I mean, uh, as explained before uh, by my colleagues, funding rate as a rule is 50%, only exceptionally can reach up to 75% for works proposals if they have an exceptionally high level of externalities. And then as regards uh, purchasing practices, uh, yes, they have to be done uh, according to best value for money. Uh, some financial management principles, lowest cost. So this, uh, this is a principle that needs to be also applied in the case of uh, purchases. Next question, can an amendment to existing contracts with new contracted activities enable funding of such activities? I'll refer again to my colleague Ona for this one. Okay, thanks, Juan, and thanks for the question. So, um, in principle, first of all, what you need to do is really to check that, that you can do an amendment for your existing contracts. And here, uh, uh, public procurement rules apply or your national legislation apply, depending from which country you are. And then, in principle, you may have a possibility to use those contracts if the procurement has been done uh, correctly. I also want to, to, to warn you on, 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 on this something, on, on, on this um, point, that any amendment is very much scrutinized for the contracts. That's why you really need to have an uh, ironclad the, um, the case that you can do amendment. And second, subsequently, that the scope of your existing contract really matches what you are planning to do under the SEF application. So if your existing contract, for example, is about legal services as a general one, and you are applying for legal services in your proposal, then there is probably the match. But if that existing contract refers to some kind of, um, I don't know, a, a general project management assistance, then I want to warn you that actually under SEF rules, 
the uh, action management is exclusively to be done by the beneficiaries um, and cannot be uh, delegated. So it is more complex than a simple yes or no, uh, and it's your responsibility to do uh, some uh, checks uh, before you actually do an amendment. Thank you, Anna. And next question, may an application be submitted by the implementing entity, noting that this is an affiliated entity of the project promoter? Uh, yes, it's possible to include the affiliated entity, which would be uh, part of the uh, applicants in the, in the proposal, and the application may then be submitted by uh, basically all the, all the participants that are included in the proposal. The, the affiliated entity and the project promoter, if they're also in the proposal. Please note that if the pr project promoter is not part of the proposal, uh, the proposal needs to explain how cooperation is ensured with project promoter, what kind of relationship does this entity has with the project promoter, and how the project promoter is involved in the, in the action implementation, if, if at all. Next question, uh, the application can be an action contributing to the PCI, but the support documents should refer to the PCI, CBA, climate proofing, state agreement. Uh, thank you for the question. So as explained before, uh, the CBA and the climate proofing need to refer to the entire PCI, but the state, or what is called state agreement, but in our language is a letter of support from the member state, this is on the application. So on the action, on the project for which a proposal is submitted. Next question, what procurement and tendering rules need to be followed by beneficiaries? I would invite uh, the person who asked this question to consult the previous presentations, but also specifically the model grant agreement, which is available on the funding and tenders portal. And there is a specific article which ex explains the rules to be followed in terms of procurement and tendering, uh, which basically consists on uh, respecting the sound financial management principles, best value for money, and if applicable, public procurement procedures. This is established in, in Article 6 of the, of the grant agreements. You may consult the model grant agreement. Next question, is the 50% funding rate fixed for works? Or will CINEA be able to adjust this downwards? So as I explained before, uh, there are only two possibilities in terms of, in terms of co-funding rate. 50% for all studies and works as a rule. Exceptionally, 75% uh, for works proposals if they justify, demonstrate an exceptionally high level of externalities in the meaning of CEF. Uh, so those are the only two possible co-funding rates for actions to be selected at this call. Uh, and just be aware that if there are any costs that are <clears throat> found uh, not eligible or not in line with the uh, conditions of the, of the call, uh, they might be taken out during evaluation or afterwards uh, during grant agreement preparation. But this does not affect the co-funding rate, which stays at 50% or exceptionally 75%. Do deliverables need to be exclusively in English? If a deliverable is an inspection report in the promoter's language, does it need to be translated into English? So the answer is no. Deliverables do not need to necessarily be all of them in English. We understand that there might be deliverables which are uh, in the national language. If that's the case, it would be, however, useful that you provide at least a, a technical a summary or an executive summary of the deliverable in English so that our colleagues who will be uh, monitoring the implementation of the project can understand the content of the, of the deliverable or the report. Next question, what is the suggested duration of reporting periods in detailed budget table, 24 months or less? So as explained before by my colleague Ona, uh, the default duration is 24 months. However, depending on the duration of your action, there might be periods of lower duration. This is understandable. But uh, by default, 24 months. And this can all be adjusted later on during grant agreement preparation if the action is selected for funding. Next question. Are visual materials for project dissemination eligible as costs for all promoters of the project or only for the coordinator? 
So this depends on how you have defined your, your project. Uh, what uh, these visual materials correspond to? Are they related to a specific work package on dissemination? Who is uh, executing this work package? Who is carrying out the tasks? Is it the coordinator or are there other participa participants involved? So basically the entity which would have uh, produced or prepared these materials and would, would uh, incur the costs for these materials would be claiming the cost to us. And this is not necessarily the coordinator, it can be also other participants in the project. Can an applicant that has received funds from the CEF call 2022 for less than 50% due to the limited CEF budget submit an additional application in 2023 call? The answer is no. If uh, you have a, an action which was selected uh, in a previous call and gets uh, support to only part of the, of the action, you cannot apply for the same action, for the same activities, because it's not possible to have a double funding. But you, can, you may apply for other parts of the, of the PCI, uh, for which an application has not been uh, submitted yet and it has not been funded yet. So what is important for you to, to keep in mind is that you cannot apply for activities that have already been funded by SEF or by other EU funds. Next question. Mandatory documents must be uploaded both in editable formats, Word, Excel, and the signed versions. Um, yeah, for this one, I think I would like to refer to my colleagues, maybe my colleague, Christina. Uh, yes, so um, the uh, when you're uploading documents, um, the system will show you what format it wants it, and mainly it's PDF or uh, Excel. So it would be, uh, so for example, the letter of uh, support, we don't need to edit it. We would rather be interested in seeing the so the signature, so that would be in um, in PDF. So yes, signed version, uh, except Excel for the budget. I think is the only document that is in that is in Excel. Okay, many thanks, Christina. Next question: Is detailed design included in the category of studies? Yes, in general, this would be uh, this would qualify for studies, unless it's a part of a a works action, a, a turnkey project, where the detailed design goes together with the construction. And in that case, it could be part of the of a works proposal. But in general, design studies are meant to be uh, studies. Can activities be funded if contained in a contract which never formally started activities receive not a notice to proceed? Um, so I would refer to the answers we gave before on uh, contracts that are pre-existing the action. If uh, there are contracts in place uh, that you already established before starting the action, uh, you may be able to make use of those as long as you comply with all the rules uh, that we have explained. So you have to be able to demonstrate that these contracts were established according to the rules, either public procurement if applicable or uh, best value for money and any costs before the start of the action would not be eligible anyway. Okay, another question on costs. The cost for logistic of equipment or workforce should be part of travel and subsistence or directly related to equipment? Thanks for the question. I will address this one again to my colleague Ona. Thanks and thanks for the question. So first of all, uh, Travel and sustenance is, is, a, is, a, is a type of cost where we are talking about, for example, your employee going to um, a factory to do a factory acceptance test. So it's a purchase of the ticket and sustenance allowance according to your practice that, that, you, that you have. Equipment is something that you buy which is embedded in the requirements for the um, uh, project. For example, you have um, direct purchase of certain uh, materials that you, it's a, your usual practice. For example, the fiber optics, which you need to, to buy. So this is the, um, uh, the, the equipment you might need. Workforce, if I understand correctly, the question is actually personal costs. 
that you need to uh, encode in the different cost category, which is related to personal costs and which is capped at 10% related to project management, if applicable. So in principle, you have different cost categories to address and you cannot just uh, blindly go and encode in one or another um, category. Uh, as I said before, I strongly encourage you to have a look into the uh, call text and in uh, frequently asked questions for more detailed information on, on this subject. Thank you, Anna. Next question, is there any recommendation or a limit maximum for the percentage of subcontracting for one task? The answer is no, there is no maximum and there is no recommendation from CINEA, so it's entirely up to you to define how much subcontracting you need for uh, the tasks in your action. What is the member state's role in project reporting? Does the member state have to approve the reports? Who sends them to the commission? Is it the member state or the beneficiary? So there is no specific role from the member state in the project reporting. The member state doesn't have to certify or approve the reports, but it's up to uh, the beneficiary to uh, inform the uh, member state about uh, the state of play of the action and uh, possibly share the report for their information. And the entity which uh, sends the report to CINEA is the beneficiary. Can an affiliated entity with a mandate or of representation launch the tender on behalf of the beneficiaries if the beneficiaries then sign the contracts? I will forward this one again to Ona, please. Yes, thanks a lot. So, um, first of all, affiliated entity uh, needs to fulfill the requirements of being an affiliated entity as, as, as nicely described my colleague Julia. So, I assume that you have done that and indeed this is an affiliated entity. Now, the mandate of representation, um, actually something which is your internal then procedure, what exactly you mandate them to do. However, we really need to um, look into the broader, like what exactly um, launch the tender means. Is it the preparation of technical specifications? Then it is perfectly uh, um, feasible for you to mandate affiliated entity. Or is this entity uh, is to announce the, actually the tender, for example, in official journal, then on how you are doing that. Is it the name affiliated entity appearing as the one who will be doing the contracts or is it the beneficiaries? So all these elements are not really reflected in the question, so it is quite hard to um, elaborate. However, to sum up, first of all, you really need to, to be sure that this is an affiliated entity as per requirements. Second, that you need to define what is the launch of the tender means in, 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 in your language and what is the scope. And third, that ultimately, if uh, future beneficiaries are subject to EU public procurement uh, directives, then all requirements by EU public uh, procurement direct directives apply here, including related to the launch of the tender. Thank you, Anna. Next question, is there a maximum number of milestones for each task? Here I would refer to the guidance that my colleague Fivos gave you before regarding uh, milestones. In his presentation you may find uh, some indications of uh, the number of milestones we are expecting for your actions, the rules of thumb, so each work package at least uh, two milestones that they started at the end, four work packages lasting more than one year, ideally one milestone every, every 12 months. Those are a bit... Uh, rules of thumb, but no uh, specific uh, maxi maximum established. Is there any correlation between means of verification for milestones and deliverables for the same task? So again, uh, I think uh, my colleague Fivos gave you some uh, useful guidance here. Basically, they are, these are two different things. So uh, milestones are the steps in the implementation of your action, which uh, allow to uh, check and monitor uh, how the action is being implemented. Deliverables are the main results of uh, your work packages and your tasks, so the main products, the main outputs of the action. And means of verification are uh, the documents or the, or the proof of completion of milestones. So in principle, these are two different things, but it could still uh, perhaps possible that for some actions, uh, the means of verification perhaps include uh, deliverables if this also 
is a meaningful way to measure the progress of the of the project. Can actions be funded if the execution starting date is subsequent to self submitter but previous contracts have options which have never been activated before? I will refer to my previous answers on similar questions uh, about uh, contracts that exist before the, the action starts. So I will not repeat the answers again. Next question, could you define start and end date for the first reporting period for this call? Okay, um, there is a little bit of confusion. So basically uh, you have to define the start date of your action. You have to indicate in your proposal what is the start date of the action and what is also the end date of your action. This is up to you. You have to tell us what is when the action starts and ends. For the first reporting period, the start date is the start date of the action. And the end of this reporting period would normally be if the reporting period is 24 months, uh, 24 months uh, after the start date. But it depends on how uh, reporting periods are defined in your case. So that's, that's the answer we can give at this stage. Next question, how detailed should be environmental and climate impact and climate resilience? So, well, for this question, checking, yeah, perhaps my colleague Ona may provide an answer here. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, um, so, uh, the question is uh, uh, how many details you can provide. So, there is a very clear template with instructions embedded in the template. What is the minimum requirement that you need to provide uh, for environmental uh, compliance? Um, I'm speaking now about environmental compliance. And here, I would really appreciate you to follow the guidance. They are there, and, and it's very clear which documents need to be signed by competent authorities in case they are applicable which information you need to provide about the PCI level uh, or you have permits uh, uh, applicable in, in certain cases. Again, this environmental compliance um, template only applies for studies with physical intervention and works. That needs also to be um, checked uh, by you before you start doing uh, anything. Climate impact and climate resilience. This is the part which is in, in, in application part form B. And here, uh, please read the, um, the headlines of the uh, box, which re refers to this um, uh, information request. And there you get already the hints what exactly is the minimum basic requirement for each uh, um, element. Uh, we fully understand that it might be that your uh, proposed project is not yet at the stage where you can provide all information as requested. If so, then please uh, make sure to write it down when then the information will become available and at what stage you are currently um, in, the, in the proposed project implementation. Thank you, Anna, for that. And next question. In order to be eligible, the cost for an infrastructure that is needed for the project, electrical connection to the grid, must be owned by the beneficiary. So here, uh, it depends how you consider this element. I mean, if it's equipment to be used for the implementation of the action, there are certain rules in the grant agreement. Uh, you may consult uh, the, the relevant section in the grant agreement. Basically, you can purchase the equipment and then you have to comply with conditions for the cost to be eligible. Uh, or you can uh, perhaps lease the equipment and then there are also rules to be applied. So the cost for uh, renting or leasing could be eligible if they do not uh, exceed the depreciation costs of similar equipment and do not include any financing fees. Or if this element is part of the elements to be constructed, then it, it would be considered as part of the outputs of the action, part of the deliverables, and then uh, the, um, the ownership is by the, um, by the party who, who has actually constructed this element. So it's a bit up to uh, the specific case, uh, what this element and this electrical connection to the grid, whether it's, it's to be considered as equipment necessary for implementing the action or part of the action itself. Okay, uh, still one question coming on environmental statements. So environmental statements from, from authorities are acceptable in national languages accompanied by English translations? Yes they are acceptable uh, as such with the translation. Okay, so it seems that this was the last question. So thank you very much for bearing with us until this uh, time. We 
sincerely hope that this information day was useful and was uh, helpful for you to understand the conditions of the call and the rules of CEF, and it will help you prepare a good application. So we look forward to receiving uh, applications until, uh, until the deadline, so please don't wait till the last uh, day to submit. Uh, it's uh, 1st September, 5 p.m. Brussels time, so please prepare your applications well in time. If you still have questions uh, on uh, the call conditions, uh, generic questions on CEF, you may submit them to the uh, info desk and the uh, email address that we have uh, also posted on, uh, on, on the page of the info day and the funding and tenders portal. And I would also like to remind you that all the questions answered today will be published in writing. And there are already <clears throat> a number of uh, FAQs that uh, are published on the funding and tenders portal, which come from previous years. So before asking a question, please check if the question is already addressed in these FAQs. And if you don't find it there, uh, you may submit a question to us and it will be addressed via, via FAQs uh, generally for all applicants. So with this, uh, I think we can conclude the session. Thank you very much again, and uh, we look forward to, to your applications and uh, have a good day.